Good morning and welcome to this year's Racial Equity Through Action and Learning Summit, Walking the Walk. My name is Sue Ellen Bennett and I lead the Center for Public Health Innovation here at Columbus Public Health. The Center was created in 2020 by Columbus Health Commissioner Dr. Mashika Roberts to increase life expectancy and improve quality of life by reducing health inequities. We do this by addressing historical and ongoing unjust obstacles that keep some in our community from living their healthiest lives. This is the center's third racial equity summit, our second in partnership with the Ohio State University College of Public Health. Today, we will focus on the actions we can take to collectively address racism to achieve health equity. Before we start, I'd like to recognize the team that put together this year's summit. Many hours of hard work by Columbus Public Health and the OSU College of Public Health staff went into creating today's event. On the next slide, you'll be able to see all their names listed. I would also like to acknowledge that the land on which we work and live in Columbus has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst indigenous peoples, specifically the Shawnee, Miami, Wyandotte, and Delaware nations. We honor and respect the diverse indigenous peoples connected to this territory. In the chat, you will see a link to our partner, the Native American Indian Center of Central Ohio, or NACO. They are devoted to preserving and restoring balance in the lives of Native Americans in Columbus. And finally, I would like to remember the late Dr. Terrence Dean, who died in August. He was a gifted educator and used his voice to bring visibility to marginalized groups of people everywhere. He was a key contributor to our first racial equity summit and fought passionately for racial justice in our community. While we will all miss his voice, I believe our presence and effort today honors his legacy. Thank you so much for joining us today and for your commitment to prioritizing racial equity in your work. Now I would like to turn it over to Makita Porter, Section Chief for Capacity Building and Education here in the Center for Public Health Innovation at Columbus Public Health. Good morning and welcome to everyone. Before I introduce Dr. Roberts, I want to cover a few housekeeping items. Next slide, please. So in order to view live subtitles today, you want to click on live transcript and then view full transcript. Also, please rename yourself in Zoom if you haven't already done so to your first and last name and add your pronouns if you wish. We ask that you mute your, uh, your phones unless you are speaking and that you have your cameras on. It helps all of us to engage better. And please use the chat feature. We invite you to engage by commenting and putting questions in the chat. If you are having any technology issues, you can direct message technology support. And then we also welcome you to use hashtags. Hashtag walk the walk 2022. Hashtag real 2022. So that we can engage via social media during today's event. Next slide, please. We do want to um, talk a bit about CEs. The following CEs are offered today, clinical social work, I'm sorry, clinical counselors, social workers, those certified in public health or health education specialists and registered environmental health specialists. If you are applying for CEs, make sure that you are renamed in Zoom, the first and last name, and that's how your participation is going to be electronically tracked and you must stay for the duration of the event and complete the evaluation. If you do have questions about CEs, you can email Jaleesa Dawkins at jmdawkins at columbus.gov. 
And now it's my honor to uh, introduce Health Commissioner Dr. Mishika Roberts. She leads our organization, Columbus Public Health, which is a team of more than 500 public health professionals who are focused on neighborhood-based approaches that address the social determinants of health from safe, affordable housing and education to jobs and violent crime in order to decrease the health disparities that exist. Dr. Roberts has a prolific 20-year public health background at the local, state, and national levels. Prior to her, her appointment as health commissioner in December of 2017, she was the medical director and assistant health commissioner at Columbus Public Health. She also built a solid foundation in public health early in her career by investigating outbreaks in Ohio for the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. And she also led an STD clinic and hepatitis prevention efforts at the Baltimore City Health Department. And now we'll hear some welcoming words from our health commissioner, Dr. Mishika Roberts. Good morning and welcome. I am health commissioner, Dr. Mishika Roberts, and I am so pleased to welcome you to the Racial Equity Through Action and Learning Walking the Walk Summit at Columbus Public Health. Thank you for joining us. Today's summit is an important one because it brings us all together around this virtual table to highlight and talk about our work to address racism and achieve health equity. Health equity can only be achieved through the shared passion, efforts, and work of everyone in our community. This work belongs to all of us, and it takes our collective action, learning, leading, and walking the walk to bring this critical issue to the forefront where we can address it together. That's why we're here today. This year, we are building on what we've learned around the history of racism and learning how to talk about racial equity so we can take action against racial injustice. We hope to give you the racial justice tools you need so you can take them back to your organizations to share with others. And together, we will explore ways we can all address racial injustice within our own circle of influence in order to make a difference in our community. So you see, we can and we will do it if we all work together. So thanks again for being here and for everything you do to address racism and achieve health equity in our community. Enjoy the summit. Hello, my name is Jaleesa Dawkins, and I am the team lead for the Capacity Building and Education team. I'm here to perform two tasks. The first, please take one minute to complete a three question poll that will pop up on your screen any minute now. And my second is to introduce the great Dean Amy Fairchild. Dr. Fairchild is the Dean of the College of Public Health at The Ohio State University. Did you know that Dean Fairchild is a historian? She has worked in several areas, all at the intersection of public health ethics and policy, including exploring the tension between privacy and surveillance, immigration and border control, and paternalism and liberty. Fairchild assesses the social, political, and ethical factors that shape the potential and limits of the state to intervene for the common good. Dean Fairchild is an accomplished author of two books and several opinion pieces and journal articles. Dr. Fairchild is a graduate of, uni of the University of Texas at Austin, and she received her MPH and PhD from Columbia University, where she was on the faculty for 22 years in the Department of Sociomedical Sciences at the Mailman School of Public Health. Let's welcome Dean Amy Fairchild as she provides us with an overview of the day and introduces our first speaker. Thank you, Jalisa. Uh, I don't know about great, but um, but some, some of what you said is is true. Um, so good morning. It's really my pleasure to, to be here with you. And I'm going to start a little bit by telling you about how the college walks the walk. You've had a lot of college folks here who are helping to organize, and I'm super, super um, proud of that and what they have done for this event, but what they do um, certainly day in and, 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 and day out. So at the college, the way we're trying to walk the walk is, um, is you know, first and foremost through supporting our, our, our students. One of the things we've done is tr create a trio of, of scholarships for trailblazing students to ensure that we build uh, an equitable public health pipeline 
that represents our shared values, our commitments, and of course, our communities. And this is going to be all the more important this fall to think about how we support our students, to think about how we create that pipeline as the Supreme Court um, is poised to potentially end affirmative, affirmative action. Um, also to help support our students, we eliminated the GRE requirement for all graduate student applicants, and we've launched an alumni mentorship program for first generation students at the college and that's really the work of our alumni societies and our faculty who support the, and staff who support those societies. We've also um, really focused on making some deliberate strides in recruiting students, faculty, and staff who have a wide array of perspectives and who continue to look for opportunities to further diversity uh, and in our college uh, community. And our research is leading and supporting work to dismantle systemic racism. And I'm, and I'm particularly proud to share that we just issued our second call for research projects focused on racism and public health. And we've added funds this year for projects related to violent extremism as a public health challenge. And this is a, an issue that's really gripped me, particularly since the, the Buffalo massacre. Um, these research funds were created in large measure um, um, and, and inspired by what we all saw happening to public health leaders here in Ohio, across the nation, in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. Not only have the people here and public health officials who aren't here had to respond to the pandemic, you've also had to respond to unprecedented levels of, of hostility, some of which was marked by social media disinformation campaigns about the nature of COVID-19 and the science of prevention, legal and legislative challenges to your ability to um, affect public health mandates, a newly energized vaccination movement that was also focused on uh, opposing social distancing, masking, and, and um, lockdowns. Um, but it's also included reports of, of harassment, Th um, threats and actual violence, uh, including from well-organized networks of, of violent extremists. In the first year of the pandemic alone, at least 190 public health officials left their jobs, high-level public health officials left their jobs uh, amidst reports of harassment, hostility, and threats of violence to them and their families. And everybody here who's from Ohio uh, certainly knows the story of, of Amy Acton that happened right here in Columbus. So these resignations, along with some retirements under pressure nationwide, have exacerbated the ongoing personnel shortage at, at health agencies around the U.S. So I would like to begin this summit with expressing a, just a profoundly deep measure of gratitude for all of you here who have persisted through this challenge on, on two fronts, What you have done is nothing short of, of remarkable. And this summit, of course, is an expression of our, our commitment looking forward, but it's, I, I, I would be remiss if I did not also take it um, as a moment to celebrate and acknowledge what we've achieved. So in that spirit, I'm really grateful um, for, for those times we've been able, when we've been able to partner with our co-sponsor, Columbus Public Health, on work to strengthen and support the public health workforce. Things like inviting young people in the city's public health camp to the university to meet with experts and learn about how they could one day become public health practitioners and advocates. And that's what we're all here about, is building that, that robust public health workforce. So finally, I, I see this summit as an opportunity to spark opportunities for deepening the relationship between academic public health and public health practitioners in the field. And so that brings us to today's uh, agenda. So today we will hear from Matea Spalanzuela, Diana Liu, Tomas Aguilar, and Amy Hahn Nelson, who will present a variety of tools that can be used to address racial disparities. Session topics will be centered on racial equity through data integration, utilizing a large justice toolkit and providing the framework for racial equity impact assessments. You're gonna have facilitated breakout sessions throughout the day, and these are gonna give you opportunities to discuss, and we're gonna encourage participants to apply these tools to scenarios you may face in your organizations and communities. 
So now it is my distinct pleasure to introduce our first presenter, Dr. Amy Hahn Nelson, who will talk about the integration of data to support racial equity. I'm gonna make her introduction brief as I promised her beforehand, because I, I want you to be able to hear directly from her. But I will say that she's a, a, a a research faculty and director of the training and technical assistance for actionable intelligence for social policy, AISP, which is an initiative of the University of Pennsylvania. And I think she'll be talking more about AISP, but it's it's an organization I, I am remarkably interested in learning more about because it helps state and local governments collaborate and responsibly use data to improve lives. She's also a community engaged researcher who's presented and written extensively on data integration and intersectional topics related to educational equity. So with no further ado, please join me this morning in welcoming Dr. Han Nelson. All right. Thank you, everyone. I um, appreciate the introduction and really thrilled to be here. Um, and I'm just, I have to say, I I'm a lot, I'm a part of a lot of Zooms and I am super impressed by the number of people on video. Um, thank you. <laughs> um, no need. I mean, everyone do what you need to do. Like, don't feel like you have to be on video, but um, that shows the, the interest in this work. And I'm just really excited to be a part of the virtual room here. Um, so let's get started with just some introductions. Um, if everyone can kind of tell us where you're from without telling us where you're from. So I'm from the Queen City, um, not the city of brotherly love, which is confuses some people. Um, I'm in the land of the pine, two hours from the Smokies and three hours from the Outer Banks. So some of you might know where that is. Um, so tell us where you're from without telling us where you're from. And we'll see those dropped in. Hi, I'm Renee. Um, I am originally from Pittsburgh, PA. And I, I'm a Buckeye. Excellent. These are great. Y'all got the assignment immediately. Um, I know exactly where many of you are from. Excellent. <laughs> Pierogies. Yep. All right. These are great. Keep them coming. <laughs> Best bagels and pizza. Uh, those are fighting words um, <laughs> from some folks. <laughs> All right. These are great. The mistake on the leg. Ooh, I'm intrigued. I almost put that too. <laughs> All right, everyone. These are great. Keep them coming. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to keep on rolling a little bit. So I, I want to just begin with a discussion of, of whiteness in this space. Um, so I am obviously a white woman, a middle-aged white woman, and I, I just want to be very explicit about the role that I play in this work. Um, the role of whiteness has a very complicated and fraught place in the work towards racial justice. Um, here are just a few uh, quotes that kind of sum up the reality of how we can show up in this space. And I just want to be explicit that um, it's complicated, right? Um, so what is the role of white people in working for racial justice? And just to be clear, I don't, I don't have all the answers. I do work in a white led majority white staffed organization within an institution in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, that has a fraught history when it comes to racial injustice. Um, so I'll just say that we are complicated. I am complicated um, and we're committed to this work, right? Um, our work at ASP is that we're singularly focused on ethical use of public sector data. data. In the United States, that means centering racial equity. With our racial history, there's no way you can use data ethically without focusing and being explicit about the role of race in how, um, in how race shows up in data. So that's a little bit about my orientation. Um, and I encourage everyone to really dig deep on these um, concepts. Sorry, I realized I was not advancing my slides. Sorry about that. Um, so what is the role of, of, of white people in working for racial justice? Um, we are singularly focused. Um, and I really encourage everyone to think about how your own identity dimensions show up in this work. 
Um, I do live in Charlotte, North Carolina, which is in North, which is in the South. Um, I am in proximity to a wide variety of different races and ethnicities um, and diverse perspectives. And that certainly shapes who I am. Um, and in Charlotte, it's really important to kind of know that about yourself. Um, you, you can't walk through the, the world here well without a deep understanding of how your identity shows up and how you do the work. So I encourage everyone to spend some time with that. Um, think about your internal dimensions, your community dimensions, your social life experiences, your institutional placement. Um, and then think about the role of power in this, right? Like all of our dimensions connote power um, and how we use that power is really how we're going to shift shift this work at all the different levels. Um, and I like to really bring it back to, you to the different levels, right? So here we're, we're mainly talking about these meso and macro places, um, but we really have to do the work at all three levels to be effective. So I have to be simultaneously working on myself my family, my children, raising my children to stand up for these things, um, while also working with my, my institutions, my school, um, my community, but also these macro forces that are much more systemic and broader. Um, so it can be hard, <laughs> but it's essential, I think, to keep us grounded um, in these in these three levels um, all at the same time. So we're going to do a little a little bit of polling here. Um, we are going to be talking today for about the next hour, um, a little more. Um, we're going to be talking about some two main issues, right? So the use of administrative data, so data that is collected by um, agencies, organizations, programs to give services and to um, execute policies, right? So this administrative data, this is government data or nonprofit held data that is used in, in theory, used to support improving the lives of individuals. Um, and then we're gonna be talking about racial equity um, and then really how you combine these two things. Um, so it's not, it's hard to you know be very comfortable with both, um, but I'm assuming many of you are and excited to be in this space. I find that public health folks are the ones who are most comfortable um, in talking through both of these things. So very excited to be in this room. Um, and help me, um, is there a way to see the results of the poll? Is there a live view? I should have asked that earlier. There is. Oh, excellent. Can we pop you ready up? for me to end it? Let's do it. Okay. Well, we if, if everyone is done, I think I think we are though. Do I need We're to stop? 75%. Nope. Okay. Great. Perfect. There we are. Results. Data. Okay. Great. Okay. And you'll be a little uncomfortable today. Um, and that's okay. You're going to feel it in your body. We're going to have some stretch breaks. You'll be able to get the wiggles out. Um, if you're not feeling it in your body today, you're not doing it right. Um, cause race, race is, um, embodied, right. The way that we experience race in the United States is, is a part, a part of our bodies. And, um, and so I just want to make sure everyone's comfortable with being uncomfortable. Um, cause again, if, if you're not uncomfortable, then we're probably not, not doing it right. All right. Let's keep on rolling. Um, next thing that we want to talk about is just to be explicit, when we use the term racial equity, what do we mean? We're going to operationalize this term together. So go ahead in the chat if you would share your definition. Everyone has their own their own definition. I'm going to share mine in a second, one of my favorites, although it changes. Um, so share your, your favorite definition. Great. These are some great definitions. So we have, you know, eliminating inequities, improving outcomes, fair access, opportunity. Um, if we were to make this into a Wordle or Word Cloud, we'd see some some really um, some big words, which we could visualize it that way as well. Respect, living freely and fully, access, opportunity, dignity. Yeah, excellent. All right, so I generally don't like to define things if other things exist that I really like. Um, so I, I I really like the work coming out of Race Forward right now and GARE, which is the Government Alliance for Racial Equity. If you're not familiar with your work, I encourage you to check out their 
their website and they did it's just a wealth of resources. So this is the way they look at this. They define this term. So racial equity is a process um, and a product um, is a lot of times they, the way you, you see it. So it's a process and it's an outcome. It is both things. Um, so I want us to make sure that we are thinking through that today in that way, right? So this is a never ending process. We will never achieve racial equity um, fully, um, but it is a never ending process and it is a measurable outcome that we can measure on certain you know, variables and, and, and data points. So we'll be talking about that as well um, today too. Okay, so real quick, I want to frame out why I am, um, why I'm here and why I kind of have the authority to talk to folks today, which I want to acknowledge um, that we have because we've talked and thought um, and written extensively about these topics. So it's why I was invited here today. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as well, um, because I am, I am the voice of many. I am the one who got like words down on a page, but this work was a collaborative piece um, and I'll make sure to, to share a little bit about that history. But first, I want to name what we at AISP do. So I'm part of a very small initiative. There are, to be down how you count us, like eight of us um, who work at AISP. And we're, like I said, singularly focused on ethical use of data. Um, that looks a lot of different ways. Our main work is to run a network of sites across the United States who focus on routinely using data to improve lives. We call these things integrated data systems. Um, but they can be called a lot of things. They can be called data hubs, data collaboratives. Um, but essentially, it's a bunch of people that come together and work really, really hard to routinely share data and integrate data to, to improve programs and policies. Um, we do this a lot of different ways, a lot of training, a lot of TA. Um, I'm a part of several. Um, I'm embedded as part of several teams um, who do this work at the state and local level. Um, and then we we do some research, but that's not the core of our work. Um, we are very committed to applied research. So the work we do is applied rather than like traditional peer review academic work. Um, the main premise of our work is that data sharing is deeply relational more than technical. When we are invited into an area that, um, when we are invited into a site to support data sharing, what we find is that the issues are rarely technical and they are almost always relational. There is um, a lack of trust. There is a lack of understanding. There has been a breach of trust at some point. Um, the technical components of this work are more and more, you know, solvable, uh, especially in the last five years. We've had some big jumps. So we focus on people, which is important. So a lot of our work, really all of our work is participatory and collaborative. Um, we don't ever like sit at our computer and just crank out something, right? We have conversations. Um, I'm actually a trained qualitative researcher. And so that um, is the basis of how I function. Um, so the work you see here, and I can drop it into the chat real quick. This is a toolkit that was created. Hopefully you all have seen it before. Um, this toolkit was collaboratively created over many years. Um, these were our contributors. So these are the people that we actually like, this was pre-COVID, we actually brought them in a room together. We gave them lots of coffee and muffins and said, here are some very contradictory and conflicting ideas um, around how to do this work well. How do we center racial equity and data integration work? And they, they sat and they mucked through the muck and they figured it out. Um, we also had a number of sites that contribute to actual work in action. We very um, explicitly don't call this like a best practice or exemplar. We don't believe those exist. Um, everything is always ready for improvement in this space. So these are work in action sites. Um, and the toolkit is oriented around the work in action. So we have ideas and then we say, and this is how sites are doing the work. Um, and this is kind of our timeline. We started this work back in 2017. Um, we convened lots and lots of discussions after we figured out funding. Um, we went through an amazing editing phase with, you know, way too many Google Docs. I'm sure some of you know what that looks like. Um, and then we began, we um, published the, the toolkit in May of 2020. Um, and it was a very interesting time for this work to be released to the public because it was the morning of um, George Floyd's uh, murder had unleashed widespread protests across the United States. That Friday, if any of you remember during COVID, um, it, it's a very stark memory for me, and I think it is for a lot of folks. 
Um, that was the day that this was released. So to say that it was timely is a, a bit of an understatement. Um, it just happened to be work that we've been working on for years that came out at that exact moment. Um, and we have learned a lot in these two years, two and a half years of um, talking about this work and um, disseminating the ideas for it. So we now lead a cohort-based technical assistance um, around this work with sites across the U.S. In fact, I just came back from that. Our last day of our first convening was yesterday. Um, so I'm still kind of um, energized by working with sites on that work in a very deep way. Um, so the main idea here is that this is ongoing work that is collaboratively created. This is not my work. Um, so I am I get to be the one who talks about it a lot, but I want to make sure everyone knows that um, this was co-created. So the main premise of our work is that um, we have a choice here with data with data infrastructure. We can choose um, for our work to be race neutral, which we all know here in this room that it is not, or we can choose to acknowledge the role of race in this work. Um, just like you know, we can acknowledge the data infrastructure of railroads and highways and say, you know, railroads and highways because of the way they were built, they either they either supported communities or decimated communities, often based along racialized lines. So in the same way, we can build data infrastructure. And so we have to be explicit in the racial context here. And we also have to be explicit with power. Um, we have power here and we need to acknowledge this efficacy and, and make changes that are race explicit. So we like to think about this work in six stages, the data life cycle. Um, hopefully this isn't a new cycle to anyone, to anyone who has any kind of um, analytics background, planning, data collection, access, use of algorithms and tools, analysis, reporting, dissemination. And we, um, the premise of the toolkit in our all of our work is that there's work for everyone to do. There is work on racial equity for executive leadership to do, to, for caseworkers to improve data collection, for um, for everyone, right? Um, database administrators it, have a, a very important role in racial equity um, by thinking about fields and which fields are forced and which fields aren't, right? There's a place for every single person in an organization who is managing data. So um, I want you to think about your work. So what part of the data life cycle does your work touch? If you are a caseworker, then you're probably going to be in that a lot of the data collection, right? Our systems are fed with data. You are the one inputting that data. You're the one sitting across, you know, a table or next to next to a person who needs services, and you are helping them fill out paperwork. You are thinking through what services they qualify for. So you are often that entry point, right? You play a critical role in our data collection and therefore our data quality and therefore our validity for anything that we're looking at. Um, so think about that. What stages of the data life cycle does your work touch? My hunch is that many of you are going to be in this data collection piece. Here's just an example of how the toolkit's oriented. I'm not going to read this to you. Just This is just to show you what it looks like. Um, and think about if you're if you are involved in data collection, um, think about, or if you're not, think about where your data comes from. All of us use data for our work every day. Where does your data come from? Is it from um, an officer conducting you know, a booking or an intake? Is it a form? How was that form filled out? Is it virtual? Is it web-based? Is it an iPad at a, you know, a social service agency? Um, is it paper? Is that paper then being input by someone else? Um, so just think to yourself and then feel free to share in the chat. Where does your data come from? A lot of folks in the public health space are using census data, American Community Survey, um, other kinds of highly aggregated statistics. Um, so that could be a good source as well. Okay, so it looks like everyone, a lot of folks are using a combination of different sources. My hunch is that most of the data, most of the data that I use in my work, I'm an educational researcher by training, a lot of like social determinants of health work. So I cross a lot of areas, but most of mine comes from a form, school enrollment and a school enrollment form, and then of course a lot of like standardized test scores, attendance, things like that. Yeah, excellent. I love that someone said mostly in English. That's a huge piece as well. Are your forms translated as they're being um, completed? Or are they being translated by someone at home with a family member translating? This, this can be really important part of data collection. 
Okay, survey data is going to be a very different thing. Excellent. Um, great conversations. Yes, the role of qualitative data in all of this cannot be underestimated. Great. Okay, so there's a, a lot. We're, we're running the gamut here. Excellent. Okay, so the next thing I want you to do is I want you to think about your data collection. So think about your agency, your organization, the data you use, whatever role you're in, right? Think about where that data comes from. And now I want you to put yourself in the role of the other. Pretend you are a client. Pretend you are the parent of a client. Pretend you are in, or you are the person in charge of data entry and record keeping. Maybe you are in charge of data entry and record keeping. Um, I always think about, I have that, I was a classroom teacher for many years and I have this like administrative secretary in my head of my first school. And she was just this like formidable force of nature in the front office, right? So that's the person I always think of with that role. So you're in charge of making sure that the records of a school or the records of an organization are up to date and accurate. Um, or maybe you're the person in charge of pulling analytic insights out of data, right? Um, think about how you're going to think about data collection differently. All right. So now I want you to think on your own. You're going to have five minutes. Feel free to turn your cameras off. Um, do what you need to do. We're going to, I'm starting my timer. Um, we are going to have five minutes on your own. Get a fresh piece of paper or a fresh screen. And I want you to pick a stage in the data life cycle. Maybe that is data collection because that's what we've been focusing on. Maybe that's not really relevant to you. Maybe you want to think about something else. Um, so pick, pick a stage in the data life cycle. And then I want you to think about two things that you do that is relevant to this. It can be two positives, two negatives, a positive and a negative, whatever combination you want. All right. Everyone clear on the directions? Great. And I'll just say, make sure you do this because you're getting ready to go into small groups and you're going to be sharing. <laughs> so there's, you're going to have to report out to folks. And if this assignment doesn't work for you, do some other kind of reflection that you can share out. That's fine too. All right, everyone. We are going to go ahead at this time, if you need to take a quick moment to turn off your camera, stretch your legs, any of that, um, and then we are going to go into breakout sessions for 10 minutes. So um, do what you need to do. Make, go into breakout sessions there. You're going to get a notification that'll pop up from Zoom and you're going to hit accept. Um, and that'll take you into a breakout session. You'll be in um, groups of about eight to 10 with a facilitator. Um, during that time, you're going to talk through kind of what you wrote and why. And we look forward to, to hear, hearing what you come up with. Feel free to drop any questions in the chat. There are a couple of us in there that are responding to this. All right, welcome back, everybody. All right, welcome back. I realized that I messed up and was talking through a question when some people had already gone to breakout groups. I just want to repeat what I had said real quick. The question was like, how do you know whether who's where where data is being made open? Um, and I think the answer to that is it, it's uh, for public health data. A lot of times it's, it's EPIs making that call. Um, usually there's some kind of data governance. It may not be very explicit, uh, but my experience is that most agencies have some kind of data governance process. It just may not be um, widely known. So I would ask the question, somebody is making that decision. Um, hopefully they're making it with a, a group of people informing their decision-making. Um, but again, my answer to most things is data governance. So Somebody is allowing these data to be open. Um, so it's up to all of us to ask good questions around that. Um, all right, so let's think about what did we decide, right? How was the discussion in the group, um, in the chat? Like, was it hard? I know, it, you know, 10 minutes is not a lot of time. Um, were there any that were like automatic, right? So let's see. So sharing of compensation by name and salary. Did you see that as like high benefit, low risk, high risk, high benefit, you know? Low benefit, low risk, or uh, low benefit, high risk. All 
All right. And then let's go to, and we'll see all these at the end. So traffic stop outcomes by race. And it's, it's important. Great. Okay. So it's important to note that the compensation by name and salary, that is like individual level data. Like in certain places, you can literally see Amy Hahn Nelson, here's her salary um, versus the next one, traffic stop outcomes by race. They're not individuals listed in that data. So that is, you know, it's a, a very different discussion of risk of privacy um, disclosure. So, <clears throat> okay. So compensation by name and salary all over the place, right? There is no agreement in this group of 200 and some odd people around whether this is a good idea or not, right? So this is a place we should definitely put some data governance around with a lot of discussion and decision-making and making sure that we have the right people at the table to even make the decision. It, I'll give you a hint. It should definitely not be people like me um, only around this table, right? It should be different ages. It should be different career levels, um, it should be different, you know, race, ethnicity, gender, all of these things. Um, we know that sharing of compensation for women can be an equity orientation um, because of gender disparity in pay, um, but it can also be a challenge for, um, it could also be an equity oriented data access piece for um, levels of career, right? So there's a lot of things to think about with this. All right. Next one, traffic stop outcomes by race. Again, this is aggregate level data. No individual names are released. What do we think? Green, yellow, or red? Yeah, there's some great, I, I hope folks have the chat up. There's some really important nuances of this. Like what does risk mean, right? Risk is different for everyone. Um, Again, like I said earlier, risk is going to be different for me than, you know, my neighbor who is a young black man um, who has been court involved. Um, yeah. And then there's also like real, real pieces around the, the state statutes. Um, all state laws are different. There are some federal protections around open data, but the real differences across the U.S. are state law. So state laws are really important to think about um, and thinking about, you know, sun, what they call sunshine laws. Um, all right, great. So traffic, this one, there seems to be more cohesion. There's high benefit, low risk, right? Probably because of the aggregation. Um, and because we know that, um, you know, driving while black is a thing, right? We know that from data. And so it's important to track that. Um, and this is one way to do it. Okay, next one, arrest records by name. Again, this is individual level data by name. And I want to point out this is arrest data. So no one here has been charged with a crime. They have just been arrested. Yeah, there's some gold in the chat, everyone. So make sure you're checking that out. Motivation is key. Why are these things, why are they called sunshine laws, right? Um, sunshine denotes like a good, happy thing. And I do not see these laws that way. There's a lot of politics in all of these. All, all of the words um, and the, the words used to describe these constructs. All right, here again, some, some good you know, agreement here. We are low benefit, high risk, um, which, which I would definitely agree with. Okay. Um, all right, the last one is daily inmates in custody. Again, this is aggregate level data, not individual level data. Yeah, and there's a good point in the chat around the integration piece, right? Um, there is a list of inmate numbers. This is assuming that inmate numbers aren't published anywhere else, right? This is an assumption that um, an inmate number is, is a number that no one else has. So it's a very important point of what does privacy mean when you're trying to de-identify or anonymize? Again, data governance, right? Um, that's really important to think about. And you just have to have people talking about this in diverse groups. All right, so this one was a little different. Um, so we're a little in the middle here. Uh, some benefit, some risk. Um, so no, no agreement. Great, I have done my job here. I've introduced lots of ambiguity 
and gray into these concepts. <laughs> um, I hope that all of you will be leaving here going, man, I had never thought about that as riskier. I had never thought about the benefit of disaggregating and releasing the data in that way. So if you are feeling confused right now, um, I'm sorry, not sorry. Um, so I want to challenge you um, as you go through your work. All of you have power in this by definition of your role, the place you are in your organization. You have efficacy in how your data is used. Um, and you can um, think carefully about um, you know, whether data should be open, restricted, or unavailable. And that has to, again, be done by data governance, people talking about the data. Um, so here, I just challenge you to think about your own open data. Um, I spent five minutes on Google and found these two sites. I clicked around. Um, again, we could do the same exercise. I encourage you to think critically about this. You know, open data is not... Um, it is not a force that is outside of our control. Like someone at our organization is making the choice to make these data open. Um, even sunshine laws, you can aggregate things differently. You can release it in a different way. Um, so think carefully about this and really discern, you know, through it. Create a discernment process is, is all that we ask here. There are no right or wrong answers as we have learned here. All of this is completely gray. It's also very, I want to make sure everyone knows too, because I understand we have some people who aren't in Ohio right now, like myself. These are very community specific. Um, what is considered ethical use in Baltimore is very different than what's considered ethical use in Portland, right? Like we all, all of our histories are different. Our racialized history of place and program are unique um, and vastly different. And so what may be palatable in one community is not going to be in the other. So we can't make any assumptions. And this is a place too, where like best practices nationally aren't always helpful because it's incredibly uh, community dependent. All right, we're gonna do a little reflection and then we're gonna close it up. So I want you to um, think about, you know, what is your biggest takeaway from today? Um, and where do you see the toolkit being helpful in your work, right? The goal here is to give tools that you can use to do things a little differently. Um, a lot of the times this work isn't about huge dramatic shifts. It's about tiny little, you know, tiny little shifts with decisions made a little differently. So just think in yourself, if you feel moved to share, please do. Um, otherwise in the chat, I was hoping we could close out. Um, oh, let me say this real quick. I just wanna reiterate, that there's a place for everyone to do this work. This isn't about the analysts. This isn't about the caseworkers. This isn't about the executive leaders. It's about everyone, right? So just making sure everyone sees their own place in this work. <clears throat> All right, one word or phrase in the chat reflecting on this work today. Maybe what would be helpful, um, what is needed, what you're gonna take back to your work, what you wish we would have, you know, hit more on besides like double the time for everything. Cause I know we, we just didn't have enough reflection. The stuff is deep. All right. I'll stop talking. Give you time to do that. Yeah, these are great. We got the right people in the room for this discussion based on the comments in here. Yeah, I, I was at a session this week and someone said, you know, Amy, we got to like make sure we're surveilling the surveillance, right? Because all of us are engaged in public health surveillance at some point. And that term means something really different now than it did a few years ago. Um, and so I encourage all of you to like surveil the surveillance, right? Like ask probing questions, make sure the right people are at the table um, and be a part of that. So. All right, y'all, I'm all done. Um, I wanted to make sure everyone had my contact information um, and we have lots of resources on our site. Um, like I said, we are very committed applied researchers. So everything we create and do comes from sites doing the work. Nothing is um, disconnected from the day-to-day -day work of government agencies. So um, please check out if you have, um, I'm particularly helpful when it comes to legal issues as well. So if you have any legal concerns, I encourage you to check out um, our new report. If, if we have any uh, lawyers in the crowd or any other folks that are grappling with how to create data framework, uh, legal frameworks for data sharing as well. Cause that's a huge equity issue. Um, the legal frameworks of all this are, are incredibly important for ensuring equity. 
So, all right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, that was very, very insightful, and uh, we appreciate the new ways to think about the data and how we can change some of our practices to be more equitable. We are going to take a quick five minute break. And when I say quick, I mean it. We're going to start exactly in five minutes. Um, so go ahead and shake out your legs, and then we will get to our next presenter, Matias Valenzuela. Thank you. Hello. Welcome back. Hi, my name is Makita Porter. I head up our capacity building and education uh, section here at the Center for Public Health Innovation. And it is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Dr. Mateus Valenzuela is the Director of the Office of Equity and Community Partnerships for Public Health Seattle King County. In the COVID-19 response, he has been directing community mitigation and recovery. He was also co-lead in the county's team for the declaration of racism as a public health crisis in June of 2020. Previously for five years, starting in 2015, he was the first director of the Office of Equity and Social Justice in King County, spearheading a countywide effort to address the root causes of inequities, especially racism, working with all county agencies and the community. Matias has worked at King County since 2000, including as a lead for equity and social justice. Previously in his career, he was a print and broadcast journalist in the United States and abroad. He has been a Fulbright professor in Nicaragua, and he is an affiliate assistant professor at the University of Washington's School of Public Health and Community Medicine. He currently serves on, a num on numerous local and national boards and advisory groups. I am pleased to introduce to you, Matias Valenzuela. Great, thank you. Wonderful. Uh, so uh, happy to be here with all of you and appreciate that introduction, Makita. Um, uh, I am going to be uh, building, I think, on the conversation we just had. I was really enjoying both hearing uh, the content and then the great engagement that the group uh, had. So hopefully we can continue it in this section. I'm going to be really um, doing covering a, a different uh, angle, but I think it complements what you already have been doing uh, this morning. Uh, and really getting into covering some frameworks and then getting into the application uh, of really applying equity tools in the work. I'm going to, before we jump into uh, the tools, I just want to make sure that, um, you know, it's important to think about how do we set up our departments and our organizations for, uh, for success. I think what we're going to be covering now, uh, tools and frameworks are extremely important, but they're not the only element that are going to be needed for organizations. Um, there's, of course, work around training and capacity building that needs to happen. There needs to be a, a leadership commitment. I think that's extremely important to be able to do um, this work. And sometimes that doesn't exist from the very beginning. I, When I started um, in, in King County, Seattle King County Public Health, I was not in a leadership position. And we did some organizing to get us to a place uh, and getting a lot of people through uh, and doing institutionalized racism trainings and things like that, that actually built some capacity, uh, even among leadership. So then we were able to get to where we are today. I think there are things too, like creating uh, clear goals and plans with accountability are extremely important. This work um, is not also is not one dimensional. It's about both hearts and minds. It's deeply personal. Um, and it's also about institutional uh, change. And um, I will show as we uh, talk about this too, how um, we really need to move into spaces both with, with employees and in community. Uh, of growth, of discomfort, uh, and healthy conflict. Um, because at the end, this work is not just, uh, you know, sometimes when we do PowerPoints, it sounds very easy and almost transactional. It's actually very deep work um, and it, it's transformational. And once you really get into it, I think, and the expectations are raised internally and in community, there is no way of uh, going back um, and you're just gonna build more and more momentum. So um, with that, if we could go to the next slide, we, um, this is a, um, there's different uh, uh, frameworks that folks use to think about and talk about upstream and downstream and uh, the uh, determinants of uh, health, which in King County we call the determinants of equity. Um, this has been, a, we have a healthy stream and an unhealthy stream and that really 
uh, underlies our theory of change of what we're trying to do in King County. Uh, this is um, a, a stream that we often use as metaphor uh, to talk uh, about uh, our work in public health. Um, we use this to actually also engage not just uh, in King, King County, this started our initiative and our work started as part of public health, but actually now it's countywide and everybody is part of our effort and uh, even the criminal legal system and uh, other transportation, natural resources and parks are part of this. And this really talks about all of government and also other uh, sectors of society. But when we think about how we have tended to um, work and also in creating systems that actually perpetuate inequities, um, the, the left side here is upstream, the right side is downstream. And you can see that um, the downstream part is also of the stream is, is, is wider. Uh, and this is where we put a lot of our attention. A lot of our attention is at the uh, individual and family level. And really, in a way, uh, you can call it stopping the bleeding or putting band-aids on, on situations. And really, a lot of our resources go into the criminal legal system, uh, into addressing uh, health problems um, and also economic problems and, and the impacts that that has very much at the individual level. And this is driven by the conditions, also the social determinants of health, the determinants of equity that are there in the middle of the stream. And when those aren't um, adequate, they're not sufficient. So around housing, around transportation, around health services, uh, around food, when there's food insecurity. And really, these are driven by upstream factors, the policies, practices, and systems, the root causes that include structural racism at, at the core. Um, also, there's uh, cross-generational inequities that we see uh, and other systemic issues. Um, and this is really the, these are the drivers that, um, you know, are driving the inequities, but we tend to address the issues and the problems. We actually focus downstream. We focus on that right side. That's where we put our attention. If we think about government, if we think about public health, we think about social service organizations and health service organizations. If we think about philanthropy too, we are really putting our efforts at that individual and family level. So what does it mean to really address true causes? What does it mean to really move upstream um, if we go to the next slide, is really the, the model and the direction where we want to go, which is really, uh, and in the equity work, it really shifts our attention from that downstream, that where we were putting a lot of attention before, to now we're going to be refocusing upstream. We're going to be focusing on those policies, practices, systems, including racial equity and addressing root causes that if we're able to create those systems, if we're able to create those policies, um, just as government and institutions have been key to create the inequities that we see today, we are also part of that solution and need to uh, be leading this. So if we create those um, equitable systems upstream, focusing on racial equity, then we can create those conditions around housing, around jobs, around the criminal legal system, around health services around uh, healthy um, built and natural environments that then people can have um, kind of more downstream at the individual and family level will be able to have the conditions that we want them to have. And it doesn't mean that when we focus upstream, we will never work downstream. It's, it's critical. And when we do work with uh, community and we work with uh, our service provisions, those are always informing what we need to adjust upstream. So there's that connection and that loop. But if we're only focusing downstream, then we're not going to get to the root causes. So um, with that, we're going to be doing more work and, and applying this framework in a bit. But I want to um, just uh, provide, if we go to the next slide, we're going to also go into a video. And this is uh, unnatural causes um, is inequality making us sick. This is produced by California Newsreel, um, and it's a, a number of videos that really look at the social determinants of health and equity, and um, the, the really the notion that if we address conditions with a racial equity lens, um, we will be able then to address some of these uh, downstream conditions. 
what we're going to see, we're going to just see a clip of this, and then we're going to uh, discuss and think about how both the stream and what we saw here in the video apply to our work. Um, so we're going to be jumping in. We're going to be seeing uh, this is an episode called Bad Sugar, um, and it's focusing on the Pima Indians um, in the Southwest, um, and really the historical drivers that are leading to the inequities that we see today and the conditions that we see today, thinking about a place and a condition and people that at, even at one time had uh, zero cases of diabetes and didn't have um, uh, the same level of poor outcomes that they had now and how some historical decisions and policies and practices, uh, structural racism, institutional racism, discrimination have contributed to the conditions that we have today. So with that, I will pause and we will watch uh, this video. There's a direct connection between the diversion of water in the upper Gila River and the health status and economic status of Pimas and Miracopas. In the 1890s, water simply stopped coming down the Gila River. Upstream, water from the Gila was diverted by dams and water projects, giving white settlers, farmers, ranchers, and mining interests the water they needed. And we were dependent upon that water to grow crops, to provide for ourselves, not even the 1908 Supreme Court decision upholding water rights for all Native Americans could protect the Pima. The Coolidge Dam. In 1930, one of the largest in the world. Its promise, to provide water for everyone, this time including the Pima. Former President Calvin Coolidge celebrated its opening with politicians and businessmen. They dined on china, crystal, and linen. The Pima ate bagged lunches on makeshift tables. Coolidge passed the peace pipe, but in the end, the Pima got little of the water, again. We were practically without water for almost an entire century. We were among the poorest people in the United States of America, as are Indians who live in other reservations and still are in that situation. Unable to grow crops, unable to get out and, and work in the fields, unable to develop economically because of the lack of water for almost 100 years was just, that's an absolute shame as far as this country is concerned, as far as the state of Arizona is concerned. What is a metaphor for the rest of the country to try to think about in terms of damming the rivers? It would be like saying to this entire country, okay, survive now without money. And how would you do that? How would you change your entire economy? How would you change your entire culture? How would you change your entire lifestyle? And would you be successful? Would people die? And the Pima did die, but they died from starvation, not from diabetes. A survey conducted in 1902 found only one case of diabetes among the Pima. But within 30 years of building the Coolidge Dam, there were more than 500. If we had not dammed the rivers back in the 1920s and 1930s, we wouldn't be able to have this lifestyle that we enjoy in Arizona with swimming pools and golf courses and artificial lakes. And with this lifestyle, we're really living outside the laws of nature. And what people, I think, generally speaking, don't realize is that all of the prosperity of Phoenix and the prosperity of this entire state was built on the backs of the health of the local tribes. Pima's lived a very, very difficult life at the bottom of the economic scale. We had almost no recourse except to become dependent upon governmental benefits. Shortly after the dams were built, the U.S. military began distributing free commodity foods to Native Americans. And it definitely brought us through the hard times. This is the commodities building, where they host the commodity food. This is where people used to come get their, their cheese, their beans, and their grape juice and stuff. They used to be just rows and rows and rows and rows of those. But this surplus food, white flour, cheese, refined sugar, lard, canned foods, is a diabetic's nightmare, as it was for Terrell's neighbor. They asked her how many people were in her household, and she said about five, and 
The guy said, well, you can get five boxes of food. And there was chips and candy and canned food. And I thought, well, that's an idea. It's a nice idea about having food, but it's just the wrong kind of food. And I asked her, I said, so what kind of, like, were there any kind of normal food? She goes, well, there were cans of gravy. It was not until 1996 that fresh produce was offered in the program, and authentic traditional foods are still not included. When we think of traditional American Indian food, for example, fry bread is one of the things that comes to mind. Well, in truth, tribes did not have fried bread historically. The roots of fry bread are in the commodity food program. And fry bread is essentially trying to do the best that you can with your commodities, flour, lard, and uh, vegetable shortening. Over generations, when people grow up with that, it becomes a part yeah. of the culture. It, it becomes acculturated into the community that that is part of the norm. There is only one small market on the 581 square mile Gila River Reservation with a small produce section. A regular supermarket is an hour's round trip drive. If you're in an impoverished community and you don't have healthy choices for food and you don't have safe places to exercise, you're tremendously disempowered when it comes to a disease like diabetes. And that has nothing to do with how much medication is in the pharmacy. It has everything to do with social determinants of health, which include that sense of control, that sense of self-empowerment that is important to all of us, whether we're Native or non-Native. It has an impact on self-identity, and it has an impact on one's sense of hope for the future. Some of our people have just given up. Our people lost their identity when we lost our water. Within our community, we have elders that have gone. I always have that in the back of my mind, that those people will never see the water. When I leave the reservation and I see those same people that live out there and use that water, how, how they've benefited from, from our loss. They've benefited it so much for so many years. Decisions to benefit some are made every day. They create winners and losers, in wealth and in health. In upscale cities like Scottsdale, Arizona, the diabetes rate is only around 5%. In less affluent towns like Bullhead City, the rate is closer to 11%. And on some poor Native American reservations, it continues to be 50%. This is a disease pattern repeated across the country, across the world, and not just for diabetes. Whether you are poor or wealthy or in between is a powerful predictor of how healthy your life will be. All right. <clears throat> so um, I hope you were able to, in this powerful uh, video series and in this particular one around bad, bad sugar, I hope you're able to see the connections, just how some of the uh, upstream and root causes are leading to uh, the poor outcomes. I mean, here we are talking about diabetes, but we can think about um, obesity, uh, economic opportunity, and many other things. Uh, it really cuts across all the different uh, outcomes. So what we're gonna do is um, go into uh, breakouts and think about the stream. Again, <clears throat> how we have tended to work, which is up in the unhealthy stream uh, and really in a system and, and perpetuating systems of inequity, including racial inequities and how those drive those poor conditions and then those poor outcomes downstream and how we really wanna be focusing uh, on that healthy stream and creating those conditions uh, at the middle of the stream and providing those social determinants of health and determinants of equity where people can thrive, but really focusing on root causes. And that means uh, at the center, focusing on racial equity and racial justice. And the questions we'll be discussing in the breakouts are just thinking in terms of the stream, where do you put a lot of your efforts? Where are you tending to focus? Is it upstream? Uh, is it downstream? And then thinking um, specifically around racial equity. 
because that's really at the heart of the inequities in, uh, within the U.S. context in particular. Are you explicitly focusing on racial equity and root causes? Um, so this one will be a, a shorter, I think we're gonna take 10 minutes um, and uh, this time we won't do report outs. We just wanna have you engage in this uh, discussion and think about how this applies to, um, to your work. So with that, we're gonna go into breakouts. I think your facilitator should have these slides too here. All right, people are starting to come back in. Welcome back. This meeting is being recorded. All right. We're almost all here. Just going to give it one more minute or one, a few more seconds. And yeah, I think we're all back here. So uh, thank you. And hopefully you had fruitful um, you know, conversations. I think it's always uh, good to have some of these and thinking about where we are <clears throat> putting our attention and where, um, what are the issues that truly we're trying to um, address. <clears throat> what I want to get into is now more of specific application of equity uh, tools and programs and uh, policies. What you see here is we, when we started with our first equity impact review tool, uh, about um, now almost 14 years ago, I have to say, it was a very extensive um, uh, uh, tool. It was probably about 15 pages. It really, Asked for analyses on all the determinants of equity and the impacts that um, a decision or a potential decision may have. And what we actually found is that it didn't necessarily get used all that often. So now we have been refining our process uh, in King County and our, and our tool is uh, similar to what we see in other places. I, I think in earlier, um, uh, there was mention of um, maybe the Government Alliance on Race and Equity and uh, they, they have similar types of tools. So a lot of local governments and state governments now too are developing equity impact review uh, tools. And really they, they cover, um, they're, they're quite similar in, in, uh, in what they are aim aiming to do and, and follow this process of thinking about starting with community priorities, really um, looking at data, both quantitative data and qualitative data analyzing of decisions for impacts, basically who wins, um, who, who doesn't, and then adjusting and looking at alternatives and then evaluating as you um, you implement and then evaluate. Uh, and, and it's an ongoing process uh, that you have. You can use um, and do very formal processes. You can also do things that are um, shorter and just embedded into um, uh, processes like we do in King County also when we look at legislation, thinking about some questions to prompt, um, how does this affect communities of color? Uh, how does this affect uh, low-income communities, immigrants and refugees? We also have incorporated it into our budget processes, just equity questions. So you can do uh, at different levels, but uh, ideally, and these, these are a couple of the, a few of the programs I, I'm gonna, uh, refer to also um, here on the right side that you see Best Starts for Kids or our work around zero youth detention or communities opportunity, which are really from the ground up, really trying to integrate this uh, equity approach, both the frameworks and uh, uh, equity review tool um, process. So um, what does it really mean and what are the key frameworks when we apply the tool? If we go to the next slide, um, this is a, an important concept, then we have used it a lot in King County. We have a, a, a local levy, Best Starts for Kids, uh, based on property taxes that um, our voters approve of, and it's really focusing on early childhood development um, and, uh, and also has uh, place-based strategies built into it uh, and really with a very strong equity focus. But I think this concept of targeted universalism is key for the work that we are doing um, uh, in, in this particular program. And with targeted universalism, you really develop 
um, the the dominant or the traditional way of doing things is that you actually create outcomes. You create a universal outcome. And in the past, there has been one often approach. Let's say you um, you're trying to have every a child have uh, child care. And what has tended to happen is that you have a one size fits all approach uh, and you have, you know, an English and really following a dominant culture. And you hope that everybody's able to achieve the, the goal um, with that one approach. But really with targeted universalism begins to really um, look at specific populations by geography, by race, by language, and really saying, let's say the Somali immigrant population, the native uh, population, it could be in the south uh, part of your county or your city, the black population living in another uh, neighborhood, everybody is situated differently, has different assets and has different um, also barriers to achieving that particular goal. So really what is needed is very specific um, strategies to be able to get to that particular uh, outcome. So that's the concept of target universalism that is key to really thinking about and uh, using kind of a pro-equity approach of uh, how do you consider uh, each of the population and not using one universal um, approach and a one size fits all, but actually being very specific and targeted um, for each population. Uh, another concept that is key um, and that we, we, we've used if we go to the next slide is um, really there's going to be systems that are going to need to be also dismantled and things that have uh, disproportionately impact that even harmed certain populations um, and really we have to just build new systems altogether. And one of the things that we look at, for example, and here where we are um, highlighting uh, on the right side here is uh, some of the work to around human resources, for example. We have built systems that have um, really uh, benefited certain uh, individuals, um, uh, especially, um, you know, uh, white um, uh uh, employees and candidates um, by just the way we screen, by the way that we look at competencies, thinking about education, doing you know criminal background checks for positions that don't necessarily need it. So really what um, needs to happen, and just taking HR as an example, or human resources, is really need to think about it <clears throat> in a very uh, different way and get rid of some of the systems that have really been um, harming or disadvantaging or creating barriers uh, first for populations, especially for populations of color, black, indigenous people of color, <clears throat> and have benefited uh, other um, uh, individuals. If we go to the next slide, the next concept <clears throat> is really focusing on people and places where greed needs are greatest. So, um, you know, also, historically, in the way we've often thought thought about things is almost as a peanut butter on bread approach is that you spread it and everybody gets a similar amount, regardless of your situation. Really, what we need to do and thinking about um, budgets, policies, opportunities, there are some populations that already have plenty of resources, services, opportunities, and really the role of public health, the role of government as well, is to focus on those communities um, and consider those populations that um, you know have been uh, left behind, that have been marginalized by systems, uh, and prioritize those and lift those up through our policies and our decisions. You know, just one example is something that we did um, now uh, some years back here in King County, working in with our <clears throat> transportation uh, uh, system, in which we created um, uh, a reduced fare uh, for um, low-income populations. So not everybody is paying the same fare, and depending on your income, you actually can get a um, low-income or a reduced fare for the buses. Um, it might sometimes uh, uh, paying a little um, more, a, a dollar uh, is not a big difference for a lot of people, but for some populations, it's actually the difference whether you have a, a decent lunch that day or not. 
Um, other things that we have done now more lately is um, also we have a free, um, you know, uh, no fare program. And also now for youth are now we are providing um, uh, uh, a no fare or a free uh, bus pass to youths uh, in our in our region uh, as well. Other things that are part of this too is actually we've been looking at um, even enforcement. One of the things that we had done um, and uh, actually fair enforcement uh, that was focused a lot on youth and actually youth being um, really having early entry in the criminal just legal system and justice system uh, through fair enforcement for not paying um, uh, fares, which is uh, pretty sad when you have kids actually just trying to get from one place to another. So really thinking about um, those people in places where needs are greatest. So where, whether it's by income or actually thinking about youth and the policy and how some of your policies might be impacting negatively some populations. In the next slide, um, we're also gonna wanted to cover the, the, the concept of, of um, uh, process equity and really having an inclusive process uh, and having this early and continuously and meaningful. So how do you in, in involve community from the very uh, beginning in the process? The traditional way that we have often done it, even used equity tools, is that we have um, included, we have we work behind doors and then we bring community in uh, later. Um, and I think when I talk about racism as a public health crisis, I think this has been one of the key shifts that we have seen also around uh, co-creation in which we actually don't um, wait to bring community in later. Uh, you actually create from the very beginning together. One of the um, efforts that we have in King County is it's a partnership between King County and our public health department and the Seattle Foundation in which we um, also uh, fund a place-based initiative called Communities of Opportunity. And through this, we also have created a governance team where um, includes community representation. And that is the group that's making decisions. They make the decisions. Um, and it actually includes representatives from community, from the Seattle Foundation, which is philanthropy, and from King County. Um, and they're the ones really leading both the design and the allocation of resources and of what um, is going to be uh, done by that uh, program. It's a public-private community partnership um, that is place-based. If we go to the next slide, I wanna get into just some of the specifics around <clears throat> what we are doing in King County. And just in terms of context, um, we were one of the early jurisdictions to start equity and social justice work. We launched in 2008. We have created an ordinance, which is our equity and social justice ordinance in 2010. We created an office of equity and social justice in 2015. I was the uh, first director of that office and then created a very um, ambitious, I think, equity and social justice strategic plan. Um, on top of that then, uh, and also given um, the uh, situation nationally uh, with really led by um, black leaders and the Black Lives Movement, um, also spurred by the killing of uh, George Floyd and other um, uh, African-Americans um, in, uh, in our country, you, many jurisdictions, and we in particular too in King County, we were um, really pressed by our community to declare racism a public health crisis. And we did in June of uh, 2020. And it was a declaration by both our King County executive, who is our boss and our public health director, uh, who is my boss. And we um, really did this um, responding to community uh, concerns and a list of demands that we had. In the next slide, I'm gonna just show some of the things that we did um, initially uh, as we launched this work to really respond to uh, community and and um, uh, and really um, try to put um, you know a down payment in terms of uh, our commitment to racism as a public health crisis, and we shifted um, we made significant shifts in uh, our budget. Um, you know when we we and we started to do some shifts on the budget. When I share the the healthy stream and the unhealthy stream, when we think about the unhealthy stream, King County spends three quarters of our uh, general fund in our criminal criminal legal system, and we had conversations with our pandemic and racism community advisory group around our budget and our county budget, and they really said, well, we need to really shift 
um, the spending instead of focusing on uh, on the jails, on the courts, on our sheriff's office, on our public defense, prosecuting attorney's office, really need to be shifting to put three quarters of our general fund into uh, health, human services, community development. So really that was the vision that community laid out for us. Some of the things that we did in both in terms of the budget, in terms of our policy agenda is we really, um, really committed with COVID, we had reduced, um, this is the adult population. We had 1900 people on average uh, in our jail, adults, this is for the adults. Uh, and we had given um, COVID, we had, and, and trying to de-intensify de and have less people in our jails, we reduced this to 1300. And really with this, um, with racism and public health crisis really pushed to uh, now continue to do it, not based on COVID, but now on our anti-racism work. We also, um, I won't cover them all, but just some examples there, including participatory budgeting and other things that we are um, doing within uh, King County and kind of just building into how we um, uh, do our work uh, long-term. And also we have uh, a, a gathering collaborative, um, which is led by, um, our executive and two community leaders, a, a black uh, pediatrician, um, uh, Ben Danielson, Dr. Ben Danielson, and also uh, Abigail Alcohawk, a native leader in health. And they are uh, overseeing uh, an effort to really both um, uh, uh, allocate $25 million in a community fund and then also uh, informing our 23, 24 budget, plus also looking for a long-term uh, vision for um, uh, how our budget should be allocated. So in the next slide, one of the things that is really key and as we, uh, another tool that I wanted to uh, introduce and as we think about this is, you know, how we engage with community. And I do think that with racism as a public health crisis, there has been a really significant shift um, to uh, towards demands from community to really push us to the right side of this continuum. So if we think about this continuum, uh, the left side, is really focusing a white dominant approach and how we've traditionally done things, which is the county informs. It's a more top down approach. But as we move to the right of this continuum, we it's more um, county consults, county engages in dialogue, county and community work together, which is that next second to the right, which is really around co-creation, right? Um, and really other places where we want to be moving to. And then all the way to the right is the community directs uh, action. And um, sometimes there is a need to be on the left side of the of the of this uh, continuum, um, and but you want to make sure that you're also uh, providing you know translations and language access and other things, and working with community and ethnic media to be able to uh, reach um, communities. But really, it's a more of a top-down approach, and really thinking about um, as we use some some our creating policies and our doing our programs, how do we actually really move to the right side, both around co-creating and having more opportunities where community um, directs uh, action and moving towards uh, approaches that are more uh, racially just. It's really uh, fundamentally too, it's a power shift. It's about, um, you know, uh, relinquishing, you know, some of the, uh, the power that institutions have traditionally have and turning over some of this power to communities so they are in the driver's uh, see, I think also uh, now, especially nationally, as there is um, decreasing often trust in uh, in government and also uh, you know often public health. Just given some of the the tensions that have existed, especially with with COVID, I think you know, and what we've experienced is that we've moved to the right of this continuum. It's a great way and very effective in actually building trust. We, act, I think, with many of our community organizations or coalitions, we've been able to increase trust during the pandemic and improve how we've been uh, working with them. If we go to the next slide, I, I wanted to make sure, and I, when I started, I was talking about um, some of the deep work and that it's also both uh, hearts and minds. And I think a key thing around this, and this is something that I, in my position, I say, I think I, I battle with every single day because it's the deeper cultural um, work and change that needs to happen. And how do we really, to be able to apply the equity tools and frameworks, we need to really address the, the uh, white supremacy culture 
and the norms that have often uh, driven our work. We probably, people here have tons of experiences. I was feel, feeling it every single day, especially around COVID in which you have to do everything you know, quick, there's a sense of urgency, um, you know, uh, and thinking about some of those concepts that are on the, all the way on the left. And it's, they're a little bit small right now, but the, the, the uh, white, the, um, and I see there is a, a question here on the infographic. I will provide some of those resources or I'll, I'll put it during um, the breakout. I will um, actually put the source uh, in the chat. But really what's driving a lot of, um, you know, the work that we tend to do is this white um, dominant culture in which we uh, really, uh, there's a sense of urgency, there's often a defensiveness, quantity is more important than quality, paternalism, you know, this either or thinking, um, you know, fear of open conflict, individualism, um, and this concept also of objectivity, right, that, and which at the end behind objectivity, it's actually there is an agenda and there is a bias and it's often a white bias. And how do we move from that to really the antidotes to white supremacy, which are having a culture of appreciation, having time to be thoughtful and inclusive. You welcome new ideas. The process matters. The process is really important. And as we dig deeper into this and even uh, the concept of when I was talking about target universalism, there are many right ways of doing things. And also really important, and this is related to the continuum, including impact, including those who have most impacted uh, in the decision-making process, acknowledging the complexity, uh, power sharing, um, not running from difficult situations and from conflict, for example, uh, cooperation, considering costs and impacts, uh, examining your lens, discomfort, is good and uh, and and learn learning will come from that and being flexible and understanding. And there are other concepts that also fit under here, like being okay with uh, you know uh, not having closure, right? For example, and things like that. That it's going to take some uh, some time. Oh, thanks for providing some of those resources um, there. So these are really important for us to um, think about and uh, and consider because it's not just applying the tool, you actually need to be able to have the people in the situations who are really gonna be able to change uh, the culture. And this means, um, you know, this is how you have to think about the whole system. So how do you build, you know, teams? How do you have folks that are from community that represent the communities who actually understand who have these different perspectives and then have processes where they can thrive and actually use those lenses. Because if you actually do some of the transactional changes and don't fundamentally change the culture behind this, you will continue to get the same results. You won't be um, able to do some of the uh, deeper change that is uh, necessary. If we go to the next slide, I, I want to focus on um, one more concept, and I had mentioned this before. During the pandemic, early on, we started the Pandemic Community Advisory Group here in King County. Um, and we, when we declared racism a public health crisis, this became our Pandemic and Racism Community Advisory Group. And is really a community-driven, community cross-sector uh, group, it includes also some of our big businesses, like our Chamber and Microsoft, and our, includes the University of Washington, uh, a lot of uh, big institutions, but then majority representation is from community, Black, Indigenous, people of color. And what we've been doing here is both as we, through our um, work with um, uh, our anti-racism work and the previous um, proposals and ideas that I had mentioned around racism as a public health crisis, we've been working very closely with this particular group, but also during the pandemic and been using them to really guide uh, our, our policies and decision making. And um, what we um, recently we did, or not, it's about a year ago now, we did create a, um, uh, a vaccine verification um, policy in King County, um, in which for, for businesses, we wanted them to uh, really um, ask for vaccine verification. But before we did that, we actually did an equity impact review process. We have an equity review, equity response team. And then we took um, what our proposal was that had already been through um, some inequity analysis to our community, including our pandemic and racist community advisory group. And they provided some very um, 
uh, specific feedback and told us where, you know, some things that they wanted to see, for example, given that some populations are undocumented, they didn't want to have an ID requirement. Um, they wanted to have a negative test option. They wanted to, us to have uh, self-attestation, for example, which means for um, to accommodate people with disabilities. We wanted to make sure that people weren't being discriminated with those policies, so have a discrimination policy. So things like that, that we were, you know, able to then include in the policy um, and one of the other things we did, actually, we delayed for small businesses. There was concern, that especially for Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities and businesses, that they'd be disproportionately impacted. So they were, um, we delayed implementation of this policy. And this is just an example of how we very quickly and in building into our structures and used the Black, Indigenous, and people of color leaders in our community to really inform our policy to actually then make it more effective, make it more responsive, make it more racially equitable. Um, and then we report back. We actually um, uh, consult with them and we then uh, report back to our community and our advisory groups and say, this is what we did and this is what we didn't do from your recommendation. And that process <clears throat> has created a huge amount of uh, trust and buy-in. And then we actually, when we pass the policy, uh, we're able to uh, much better um, uh, implement because we have uh, very significant um, community support from community leaders, especially BIPOC um, leaders. So um, these are just some of the very concrete examples of how we use the tools and how we work with community. Um, it's you know not always easy. It's often very, uh, very messy as well. What I um, wanted to do now is actually, if we go to the next slide, is we'll do, um, I know I presented a lot of concepts, uh, a lot of concepts, but I want to really focus on four of these, um, again, which is targeted universalism, which is how, actually, how do you think about specific communities um, and populations uh, by race, by, um, by geography, uh, by language? How do you dismantle systems of injustice when they don't work? How do you focus on those people and places with greatest needs and put your resources and attention on those populations and process equity. So how do you actually create processes that are more equitable, that you include those voices of people who have been historically marginalized, include them, and they are leaders in um, shaping your programs and shaping your decisions. So what we're going to do now, we will go into um, breakout rooms and we will have more, a little bit more time uh, uh, this time. And um, we're gonna. We have a, a scenario, and the scenario is that um, the we're in the health department, and we want to create a new procedure to provide a staff mentor to businesses that continue to receive substandard food inspections. It's identified that the majority of the food businesses receiving these substandard inspections are immigrant and minority-owned establishments. So I'm gonna put the scenario here in the chat. And I think also the um, your facilitators will have these scenarios as well. And what I want you to think about is um, for this, there's going to be some folks who are going to be thinking about targeted universalism, others around how just the smelling systems of injustice, other focusing on people and places with greatest needs, and then others on process equity. So you'll take one of those um, key concepts and thinking, applying one of these, depending on the group that you're in, um, what approach could the health department take? And then centering on racial equity, how do you, um, how can you center on racial equity and how can, be, how can the intervention be co-created and or how will community uh, be engaged in, uh, in your process? So um, with that, we're gonna go into our breakout rooms and- um, Dr. And Valenzuela, quick yeah. question. Uh, there were a few questions in the chat. Do you wanna just take those after the breakout? Um, if we have time, I'm not seeing the clock. And so I don't know, do we have time now to take some? We do not have time right now. Okay, so maybe at, at the end, if we have some time, and I'll take a look at some of the questions uh, too. So let's let's Excellent. go into the the breakouts, and then we'll try to incorporate those too. And this for this time, we are going to be um, reporting out. All right. 
I think people are mostly back, so uh, welcome back. Hopefully people had really good conversations. I did get a chance to see some of the questions that had come up. I'm going to just address some of them really quickly um, just before we, we do some of the report outs. And one question I saw was, what about the things that were recommended by our advisory group and we didn't take, um, we didn't incorporate. We one of the, and there were there are things like that that happen sometime, right? And we um, really by actually being very transparent and even sometimes talking about our limitations, like our resource limitations. I think um, we found folks to be quite um, sympathetic or understanding. Um, not always uh, the ideal, but I think bringing people along makes a huge difference in terms of at least being able for them to understand some of the decisions why they were uh, made. And then another question was around um, who serves in our advisory group. And one of the things I think for really in, important in our um, in this main advisory group that we have, the Pandemic and Racist Community Advisory Group, is it really started as a group that we had from our county um, census, uh, Complete Count Census Committee. Uh, which had just um, been active right before the pandemic. And um, we included that group, uh, since they included different sectors, but we, when we declared racism on a public health crisis, community leaders actually asked us that they wanted to lead the group. So then we created a steering committee uh, of six people. There are five community members, uh, black, indigenous, and people of color, leaders and then there's one public health representative and that's me and we are they are driving the agenda and they also when we see gaps or needs to improve or um, uh, change the composition of the group um, uh, they're the ones that, that are really in the driver's seat okay so we're gonna um, want to hear back from uh, groups and um, and about the discussion you just had and, and, and some of the ideas and uh, some of the approaches and then how you can center um, racial equity um, and involve uh, community. So um, let's see if we can have people and people who are gonna be reporting out, maybe you can raise your hand and then I can, um, call on you once we, I'm seeing Anne first and then Juliana. So let's start with Anne and then Juliana. Hello, I was in group two and we had um, a scenario of um, ethnic you know, restaurants um, getting kind of subpar um, inspection reports and kind of how we can address that. Um, and we had a really thoughtful discussion about how we could really assist um, these restaurants by um, maybe have, making sure that there's shared expectations, making sure that they understand the expectations um, for them and make sure there's no language barriers um, in making sure that they completely understand what's expected of them to get a good report. Um, and then kind of looking at, um, is everybody having a consistent, like, is there a common issue occurring among all of those restaurants um, or is there just a general bias towards restaurants of, um, you know, who are, are run by certain um, cultures or populations? Um, and then making sure that they have um, equitable resources to actually meet the standards that are expected um, for food safety. Um, do they have the right equipment? just making sure they have the equity and resources and supplies. Um, and then making sure that the laws themselves are understandable um, and are there ways to educate them and take into consideration their, their culture when we do. Um, they Oops, Ann, I think you went on mute. You coughing. Oh, sorry, I somehow went back to mute. Um, sorry, can we be culturally sensitive and flexible in our laws? Um, and I, we thought that if we went through a uh, overall health and safety perspective, we can come up with what to do best when culture. Oh. Can everybody still hear me? I'm getting. I we can I'm, hear you, Ann. Okay, I'm can... having technical difficulties over here. Sorry. Um, so yes. what to do when um, culture bumps up against public health best practice? Um, so kind of taking an overall health and safety perspective, but making sure that we 
um, we work to to get the the people who own the restaurant um, up to speed in a, an appropriate way. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, we're going to go to the next group. I think it was uh, Juliana, and after Juliana, we'll do uh, Beth and Abigail. I'm just going by how they're appearing on it. Amazing discussion in group 15. So thanks, um, thanks to all who contributed. And um, we were looking at framework three, so um, how we focus on people and places with greatest need. And some of the ideas our group came up with were ensuring that we were um, meeting directly with um, the leaders within um, the restaurants, but also um, trusted leaders within the community. Um, in conversations, making sure that there were um, subject matter experts at the table, um, maybe in more than just, um, you know, food inspection itself, um, but also in understanding needs of the community, making sure um, if translation services were necessary, that it's not just translating words, but also within the context of the culture that that really matters. Um, so those were some of the things our group came up with. Great, thanks, Joanna. Uh, Beth. <clears throat> yeah, building up on, on that, we also talked about language and culture, but also acknowledgement of acknowledging the past history of the, um, where were the pe previous experiences between the agency, the public health agency, and also the community. Um, and then also determining what is the desired outcome. Is it that the health facility, health wants everyone to pass? Or is it that um, health wants to eliminate the, the businesses that don't meet the standard and coming to terms of what is um, from the government side, what is the um, outcome that we want? And then we talked a lot about working together, you know, using the system of having a person from the community um, to help with the mentor so that there is that uh, understood language. Great. Thanks, Beth. Uh, Abigail, and then we'll go to Chris. I'm from group one, and I'll just add on top, many of the things that have already been raised are, are themes that came up in our group as well. So a couple different ones are um, recognizing that an owner of a restaurant in this setting, um, it, it, it's a it's a source of economic stability in a population um, and perhaps a family environment that has not been able to access resources of government in other places. And so it's extremely threatening for an entity of the government to um, jeopardize that. And so creating an environment where there can be a relationship that establishes trust and working toward a solution as opposed to uh, some kind of punitive measure and, and essentially how foundational that, that is going to be in some communities. Um, and then the last thing, and this has been raised a bit, but more explicit acknowledgement of cultural differences in baseline expectations um, and recognizing why people may not be um, following rules that are perceived to be uh, sort of normative um, in, in this environment that, that is not their, their, their background um, and making sure that there's clear understanding there. Thank you. Let's go to Chris and then we're gonna, we're. I'm not going to be able to have everybody, so I'm going to just say next after Chris, we'll have uh, Kruzia. Hopefully I uh, pronounced that uh, correctly, and then Donnie, and then we'll just uh, wrap up right there. Thanks. So springboarding off of what a lot of other people shared, um, we thought it was important to determine whether the rules were like a customary, um, you know, cultural expectation on our end or is it actually like a safety like health and safety issue um and being mindful that that can look different for different communities um and try to come together and you know educate on things that are safety issues and try to negotiate in others um we also wanted to include not just the business owners but also the staff or at least the managers um so that they can be part of that discussion and help disseminate that information. Looks like we have two more individuals. If we can make those succinct in order to squeeze in a break before our next speaker at noon, that'd be great. Um, I think I was next. Um, my group was group number 24. We had a wonderful discussion. We discussed a lot of things that have already been said. One thing that our group brought up was that maybe um, 
we were focusing on framework for process equity. And we said maybe um, we should include everyone from the beginning in coming up with maybe new rules on how inspections should be taken and all of that. But we should also focus on the inspectors themselves. Um, make sure the inspectors are culturally trained and understand the communities they're dealing with and make sure that if they're going into minority and immigrant communities, that there is not a language barrier coming up. And so making sure that um, on the policy side, there is training. And then on the implementation side in the community, the community feels like um, they are being heard at, at all levels. And so they need to be um, included in the process too. Hi, this is Krizia. Um, So for group 13, great job, group 13. Um, we had a lot of the same similar uh, pieces that everybody brought up, but um, something that um, was brought up was also comparisons of violations that are happening. So um, if they're, if we're seeing violations in restaurants of different minority groups of vulnerable populations um, of different cultures and ethnicities, what are we seeing in the groups that are not BIPOC? Um, what types of violations are there? Um, someone even brought up a scenario that happened to, in their community where a very high-end restaurant um, had a video taken of a mouse in one of their pans. And this was just uh, too uh, recently, right after having a food inspection. And then they went back in and noticed that there were a lot of violations. So making sure those inspectors are trained, like uh, Don said, but also making sure that there's a mentor in place, there's practice in place, and that there's monitoring. Because a lot of what we see is a lot of trainings are like a one and done. And then, okay, see you in five years or see you in two years. And we see that with health equity as well. There's no practice built in, there's no monitoring, there's no refresher. Um, so those things might also be beneficial. Great, wonderful. I think we're at time. I know not every group got to uh, report out, but I do appreciate it. It seems like there were some just great discussions. Appreciate everybody's engagement. And I will just conclude asking folks to put one word or a phrase just quickly in the chat of just a key takeaway or any aha. So thank you very much. Dr. Valenzuela, if you wouldn't mind putting your email in the chat after everyone has added their word, there were a couple of questions that we didn't get to. Happy to. Thanks. And as we're doing that, we will move. We have moved to a break. We have a five minute break. Um, if folks want to stretch their legs or grab a cup of coffee or something, we'll see you in five minutes. Thank you. Uh, all right. Welcome back, everybody. Um, so uh, my name is Andy Wapner, and I am from OSU's College of Public Health. As you can see, I'm the co-director for the Center for Public Health Practice and a clinical assistant professor in the college. I also direct our Master's in Public Health program for experienced professionals. And it's my pleasure to introduce our next two speakers. Um, so Diana Liu believes in the power of elevating transformative health equity work to drive social change through strong communications. Diana's work at Praxis as the Program Director of Communications and Media uplifts Praxis's mission, approach, and work, and the work of, our, of the Grassroots Network fiscally sponsored projects and other partners through communications and media. Prior to joining Praxis, Diana held a variety of roles at health outreach partners and work with work including communications, technical assistance, and training, and client consultation to advance health equity within community health centers. Diana also coordinated an LGBTQ wellness program at Apicha Community Health Center in New York City and worked on immigrant rights initiatives at the New York City Commission on Human Rights. Diana has a BA in Arts from Sarah Lawrence College. And our next speaker um, uh, working with Diana will be Tomas Aguilar, is the, and he is the Operations Manager at United for a Fair Economy, where he works behind the scenes to ensure the day-to-day -day operations run smoothly. Most recently, he spent five years working for Living Hope Wheelchair Association as a disaster justice coordinator, technologist, and co-director. He spent the majority of the last 20 years working as a social movement technologist, organizer, and communicator in the economic inequality, environmental justice, and migrant justice movements. He's also passionate about creating a more inclusive society 
by integrating language justice principles in all his work. Please join me in welcoming Diana Liu and Tomas Aguilar. Thanks so much, Andy. Thank you. And I'm just going to wait for Tomas to. Hey, thank you. Thanks for that great intro. Yeah, great. OK, so um, we are here talking to you all about language justice. Um, I'm from the Praxis Project, which I'll tell you a little bit about. So we're a national nonprofit, and we were kind of at the intersection of like public health, health policy, other policy, education, and community organizing. Um, and I'll say a little bit about that later, but, but our mission is to build healthy communities by transforming the power relationships and structures that affect our lives and communities. And so we really work on kind of like that structural kind of systemic level that um, we were talking about a little bit earlier with the social determinants of health. Uh, we, our primary framework um, in a lot of our work, especially with uh, public health um, policy and education is really um, the social determinants of health. That's kind of our health equity framework. So we work really closely with community power building organizations and those type of like power building efforts that are kind of in local communities to work on those like that structural and systemic level to impact change on those conditions that underlie health equity. Um, and beyond that, um, we really believe in community power as kind of the solution um, and explicitly connected to health equity and racial justice. So we work with um, community organizers broadly and, and base building organizations to help shift power to communities um, that are most impacted by inequities in order to create change that is sustainable and that is lasting. So I'll pass it on to Tomas to tell you a little bit about what he does. Great. Um, thank you, Diana. Um, so yeah, so um, I, since July, I've been here working at United for a Fair Economy uh, as an operations uh, person, coordinator, et cetera. Um, but the story began a long time ago. Um, over 20 years ago, I worked here for three years. I was a communications uh, coordinator. Um, I also worked on uh, national level uh, campaigns, you know, trying to keep an estate tax in place, um, yeah, et cetera. So um, United for a Fair Economy. So we work on challenging the concentrations of wealth and power um, that, well, you all know when we have them, you know, it could corrupt our processes, our democracies. Um, it increases the divides that already exist in our country. It makes them even wider, right? Racial, um, racial divide. Uh, our communities are torn apart. Um, we use different, um, different techniques to do this work, right? We have a group of people in the top 5% of wealth or income that use their position to advocate to lower the ceiling so we can have better and more equitable policies. Um, and they believe in paying their fair share. And on the bottom, um, we believe in, as they say, um, raising the floor, right? Supporting groups on the ground um, all over um, with, with their campaigns, with their policies, providing analysis and, and actual you know, so, uh, support, um, not unlike what the Praxis Project does, right? We use a popular education uh, pedagogy um, and we do trainings, creative communications, et cetera, right? Um, so we, we believe by, by doing these two things, um, we're, we're doing our fair share to try to help change to, to a better world, the world that we all want to be part of, right? Um, and not just to survive, but we want to thrive, right? So. Thanks, Tomas. Hello that description of the work that y'all do. Um, so I know we've already done a lot of intros, but we always wanna just like recognize that we are all like sitting on stolen land here in the United States. And so if you know the native land that you live on, go ahead and type that into the chat, along with one question that you have about language justice. And that could be like, what is language justice? Is it the same as language access? Um, so go ahead and type in, if you know the native land that you're on, and also um, a question that you might have, and we'll try to get to those throughout the presentation.
I grew up in West Virginia, so it's it's um, really close to Ohio, obviously. So it's um, nice to see some of these tribes. Uh, how can language equity be achieved? Um, is language justice relevant in places that are highly English dominant? That's a good question. LGBT and trans inclusion. Uh, how can I find my native land? Hey, Tomas, do you have like a quick link mm. by any chance? I usually have one pulled up and I totally Someone forgot to actually just dropped it in the chat. Oh, good, yes. good. I'm so glad. Thank you. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's that's the perfect one. Exactly. How does language justice impact work on diversity, equity, and inclusion? Our language justice, wait, uh, um, how can language justice be achieved in hard to reach areas? <coughs> Does language justice extend beyond actual language to methods of communications? themselves, preference for visual, verbal communication. Yeah. I like the comment uh, about securing funds for language need, um, and we'll touch upon that. How can I be an advocate for language justice? Okay. Does Language extend to communication processes. Absolutely. Okay. Another question about how do we incorporate language justice in DEI work? Does language justice also relate to use of inclusive language, people first language, et cetera? The levels to language justice will definitely cover that. Okay. These are really good questions. Thank you. I love seeing all the different places um, you all are at and the land that you're on as well. Um, so the Praxis Project is usually, well, usually I'm on Ohlone land um, in the Bay Area, but I'm actually in Northern California. We're on our staff retreat and um, I'm skipping this part of the day, but we had the local Pomo um, Indian tribe come and like talk a little bit about um, their history here and lead us in the land acknowledgement earlier this week. And so that was really lovely. Um, and so the Praxis Project right now is on Pomo land here in the Russian River Valley, Anderson Valley of California. Um, and Tomas. Yeah. Um so here in, in, in the Boston area, um, we're on, oh, didn't make it, um, Massachusetts land, right? There's different bands and, and, and whatnot, but uh, in general, uh, Massachusetts is a name that was taken and that's how we know this area right now. But the original um, meaning of the name is, um, it's a tribe here in, in this area. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, uh, so um, when before we start talking about language justice, I just wanted to present this like amazing kind of incredible definition of a multilingual space to kind of show you all like where we want to end up in this journey and what that might look like, because I think it helps us like envision what is language justice and how it's different from like just language access. So I'm gonna go ahead and 
Oh, oh wait, did I skip a slide? I totally skipped today's objective slide. I'm so sorry. Sorry, I'm gonna go back to this and then I'll, I'll go and read our quote. Um, but our learning objectives for today, and of course, we'll try to answer some of those questions that y'all named in the chat as much as possible as well. Um, but they are to identify the principles of language justice from a justice framework, um, practice mapping language justice within the roles and processes in your own organizations, and then identify language justice gaps from the perspective of service users with some of the awesome um, scenarios that um, Columbus came up with in your breakout groups. So we'll go ahead and move into that like definition. Not definition, the, um, yeah, I guess definition. I'll go ahead and read it. A multilingual space is a constructive space where all languages in the room are on equal footing in terms of being spoken, written on flip charts, in the handouts, and et cetera. And no language holds an advantage over another. Speakers of all languages share in the out loud space and everyone will at some point plug in discussion through interpreting headphones. Speaking English is not an advantage over others. A multilingual space creates room for the agenda to flow according to other cultural norms besides the dominant white US cultural ones allows for other styles of facilitation to come up and allows people to participate with cultural pride in speaking their own language because a multilingual space works to break down the feeling um, of non-English as handicap. Sorry, that should be of, but not on. Um, Tomas, do you know where this came from, this quote? I think that you were- Yes, involved. Um, that came at a, it was a, a national gathering with the National Network of Immigrant and Refugee Rights, and we were having a whole session on language justice. This is the early 2000s, and it was a, this was on a flip chart paper. Um, and I know inside this toolkit that um, that's going to be presented later, it's in there along with a photo that uh, well that I took of the of the the folks that had this quote, right? So yeah, it was at a session, a national session we had. Awesome. It's so great to have Tomas here because he was intimately involved in developing this toolkit and some of like the discussions that led up to this. And so I'm really excited. Um, we can go ahead and move on to the next slide. But I just like wanted to open with that because when we're talking about language justice, we're really talking about this like place that we're gonna hopefully get to at some point, but um, it's an ongoing process and it's not gonna happen immediately. And of course there's gonna be a lot of interim kind of steps in between, right? So um, defining language justice, we don't really have a single or static definition. And that's because we're working off a working definition that's gonna change, ideally deepen as our movements grow. And as we learn how to advance language justice and as the needs of our communities are shifting, right? And it's really about building and sustaining multilingual spaces so that everyone's voice can be heard. And I think that absolutely would extend to other types of communication, making sure that people who communicate differently have all the means that they're able to participate fully in a conversation. Um, it's about recognizing like that power dynamics um, of in inequitable language access can create um, scenarios that like make it so that people can't participate fully and that we wanna be dismantling that in order to build strong communities um, to advocate for social and racial justice. And I think it's also uh, the idea of language justice is kind of rooted in this like history of resistance by communities and peoples whose voices and cultures have been suppressed so that it's like an alternative to historical disenfranchisement where um, our languages and cultures have been, dis have been suppressed. Um, I, I always think about how we don't actually have a official language in the United States, but obviously like reading and speaking English is reinforced through so many of our institutionals, our, our, our institutions and cultural norms, including schools, media, businesses, other social forces. And I think that people who come from a language background that's not English have all felt the pressure to assimilate and acculturate in this country by adopting English. I definitely remember taking like grammar and pronunciation correction classes when I was younger because I had an accent and that wasn't okay. Um, and so we can collectively start to shift this so that no one's like being left behind and that we're able to kind of embrace ourselves as our whole selves through kind of like thinking about 
what does it look like to create language justice in our communities? I also want to mention really quickly that it's also related to power, right? Like we, um, if you have the ability to like be in a space to speak up, to participate fully, then you have power in that space. And so language justice calls us to kind of like organize um, and like address that, that piece of equity when um, we're having conversations in our communities or like when we're developing programs as well in um, our organizations so that people can fully participate, express the way that they're comfortable expressing themselves. Um, and when we prioritize that, uh, we benefit from all the diversity that, that having people fully participating at the table brings to the table. And we'll go into more um, specific details about that later. And we can go on to the next slide. So some of the principles of language justice are that it's really rooted in social and racial justice and health equity. We're, if we're trying to address these things in our work, then we need to be thinking about language justice. Um, I think that language in itself is a tool for transforming thinking and empowering action. Again, we can really expand our knowledge and understanding when everyone at the table is able to be fully participant in those conversations. And multilingual spaces are open to every voice, which means there's no dominant language ideally. So going back to that kind of like ideal state that we opened up with, and it's really about shifting the way that we think about language and normalizing multilingual spaces whenever possible. So you can see that language justice is more than just, you know, the like language access piece, more than just making sure there's an interpreter in the room or that we have our resources translated. It's about creating opportunities for people to have agency and like a real voice to impact work or ultimately the work that is in service of them. Um, go to the next slide. So uh, just some like key terms and concepts to like, you know, kind of be concrete about what we're talking about when we're talking about language justice and language access. This is more kind of on the language access realm, but um, you have to interpretation, which is like the oral process of like making sure that a spoken language is trans uh, is interpreted from one language to another, I guess rendering, I'm not supposed to use the definition or the word in the definition. Uh, there's different types of interpretation. The first one is consecutive. That's when the speaker, a speaker speaks and then the interpreter um, repeats it in the another language and then you, you go back and forth. Simultaneous interpretation is when the speaker relays a message and renders that message at the same time that the speaker is talking. Um, with consecutive interpretation, it's pretty easy because you have one person and you kind of just go back and forth. It takes longer, but um, it's pretty low tech if you're having like an in-person event. And then simultaneous interpretation does require like equipment where you either have like something set up on Zoom or you have interpretation equipment available for participants. And then translation is kind of like the written aspect of that. So rendering a written document from one language to another. Um, go to the next slide. So I, I also wanted to share like some of these headlines from 2020 when the COVID um, epidemic kind of started because I think it's important to kind of see what happens like when there are language uh, access gaps. And I think that during that time, there were a lot of really clear examples of how um, this, us just like broadly not having like language justice or language access like infrastructure in place, it, like in real time impacted people during the pandemic. A lot of communities were not getting important information about um, how COVID was transmitted, how to get tested, how to access resources. And so we saw a lot of these kind of show up um, in the news. And I know that a lot of the work that you all are doing, like um, at, le at least with like health centers and public health departments, like are around cultural competency, cultural humility and the natural national class standards. Then I think that those are really helpful as like a beginning, like starting point and guideline, but that it's really, that, that really is what it is. It's kind of like a starting point, right? It still is not addressing stuff like this that's happening um, when a, a pandemic or emergency happens. And so to like really think about like the language justice journey as like an ongoing process 
um, it doesn't end once you meet a set of standards. Ideally, like where we end up is when this doesn't happen, when like there's not information in the news where like people are not getting the right information because of language access barriers or language barriers. And I think that what's really important to know is that the foundation of like language act, language justice is like really being able to like build authentic relationships and trust with your communities and engaging in language justice work amongst other strategies. Um, and that's gonna take time, consistency and commitment. Uh, but this is kind of like just a starting point. Um, we'll get into more concretely what this means for you all. Like obviously we're not gonna like all of a sudden have and create multilingual spaces, but the idea behind language justice is that it is bigger than language access itself. And I'll pass it on to Tomas to go through our justice framework. Wow, thank you. That that was that that was really good, and, and you're triggering a lot of thoughts, even as we present, right? Um, and I'm going to touch on some of those. So we we use the term justice, and we use frameworks, right? Um, as Diana and other folks, uh, Krizia, Beth, in the earlier comments, I was like, hmm. Yes, it isn't just like a one event thing, right? It, it's just, if we were worried about uh, what they call DEI, other frameworks, um, language and how we uh, participate in society, right? In the popular education uh, pedagogy, we use like full participation, right? Um, people being able to speak in the language of their choosing, right? These are all leading to justice, right? Justice, which hopefully leads to liberation, right? So a justice framework. And, and let's break this down a little bit more. Um, I will give credit for some of the work, uh, first, the Praxis Project for many years, a few decades that I know of that have been involved with. Also, I remember at United for Free Economy 2003, going to the Highlander Center with their multilingual strategies, training organizers and activists and and, and all sorts of great folks all over the country in this whole idea of language justice, right? And then recently working in Houston with Tecolote, which means owl um, in, in Houston. Uh, so we're gonna use some of the things that, that they have produced with us. You know, we, we like to say we collectively um, design a few of those things and please check them out. This will be in the materials, right? Uh, their links. Really great work. Uh, there's no need sometimes to reinvent, reinvent the wheel for a lot of things, you know. So so let's go on to the next slide, um, right? So again, the difference between access um, and then justice and yeah, like rights, right? Diana gave a really great intro here. Um, so language can be, we can discriminate whether we intend to or not against certain folks that if you don't speak the language, or like in my case, I've worked really hard to try to speak what's called the like, official English and whatnot, code switching, they call it, right? Otherwise, there's an element of discrimination there, right? So uh, when we think of justice, we want to be free of that, right? Um, so um, we also want to be able to fully participate in society, you know, civic participation, which is not just voting, but it is voting, other forms of participation, right? Um, I did a lot of work in disaster justice, right? And the stories and the work that we did, trying to change systems and working with agencies that want to do different things, but they they have budget cuts and all this, so they don't have the right staff, the amount of staff, yet Hurricane Harvey in Houston, and people need to get through to the helplines. They need to understand. So mapping out every step of the way, right? All of this is part of language justice, right? Um, you know, the, the mundane, nitty-gritty things that can make or break a person's access to aid or, or survival, right? Um, there's also, uh, you know, we acknowledge land rights, right? And, and that's great, but it's not just about that, right? What about the different languages that were here and existed before we arrived? And maybe these languages existed before, um, before English, just everything evolves. What's up with that, right? Here I am code switching this, I'm, I'm trying. I'm like, what's that story? So it isn't just, um, about the English language. It's about being able to fully participate, right? Um, and we want to respect and we want to value it because with language, is there's so much behind it. There's culture, there's community, right? There's so much behind it. 
Um, think about it. We talk about uh, earlier in the chat. There was a there was a a question or a comment about how, I think how does it relate to DEI efforts, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Well, for me in, in the work in public health, even though I'm not a, a professional in it, working at the community level, we're like, all right, when we talk about trauma informed and all that, which, which is really good understanding all this. Um, now, as a community, we're learning, and, and thanks to a lot of the work uh, the Practice Project has been doing, we're, we're, we're looking at healing informed practices, right? How do we in, in terms of language, how do we see it not just as an individual thing, like, hey, Tomas, you know, we'll try to get interpretation, or we'll, someone will translate it for you. How do we get it from approach of like, what's the community approach, right? Community healing and all that. It involves language, right? It involves written language, spoken language, and American sign language, right? It also involves language in, and you look at class, right? If Tomas speaks me, uh, um, I work throughout the years, I know I sound perfect right now and everything, I'm just kidding. But like code switching, right? If I'm used to speak in a certain way and then this space that's created that might offer some health access or whatever, I don't understand it or they're speaking in a way that doesn't make sense to me, what's going on there, right? So we wanna respect all forms of communication um, and we want to respect it and value it. Okay, next slide, please. Um, yeah, um, it's kind of what I was just saying and what many of you have been saying, you know, if you can't be meaningful, meaningfully involved, fully present, right? So what are we really doing, right? Um, how many of us have been part of efforts like we do community outreach, we're going to do vaccinations, we're going to do educationals, we're going to answer questions and whatnot, right? But if the way we're approaching it is not accessible to folks, right? Now we're talking language access, right? To begin with, right? Not just not just translating it in its official Spanish. What does that mean? Then we got to think like in technology. Let's localize it. What is the, the Spanish that's spoken in these communities, right? That's taking it a step further. If we can't do that, how can we sit there and ask people, well, they're not involved. They don't want to show up. They must not care. That happens all the time, right? It's happened to me, and sometimes I don't have the words to defend myself. Back then, now I can Google everything, right? Um, and then there's a question that Diana was talking to earlier about power, right? It is about power, right? Um, it, you, we can really easily exclude people, right? And then even create some harm, right? Um, or we can use language and inclusiveness, et cetera, to really build this power. And then hopefully, if we're thinking about justice, the self-determination, right? We talk about liberation, right? So these are some major, major um, items. And there's more. Next slide, please. Um, when we talk about social movements, um, no, go back, please. When we talk about social movements, right? Think of your work. You're part of this movement. You're doing this because you care, right? And it's super important work, right? Um, so to do this and to build with other communities, right? We have to understand each other. And also we have to really want to understand each other and value, like I said earlier, people's way of speaking and people's way of writing, or sometimes it's not right. My dad couldn't read or write in Spanish, much less English, right? So how do we build these movements where like, wow, let's acknowledge like children. How many of you have seen children interpreting for their parents, immigrant? families, right? It's a thing. They're professionals. They're doing this amazing work. I did it when I was young, right? So um, yeah. Um, then another thing, right? I use this, this example. Um, we were at a training once and it was a good training, good topic, but it started out with like, hey, okay, so for all of you that don't speak English, make a line over here. We got interpretation equipment. Yay. Okay. And all this stuff. So then, but the event, because of time, the event started, right? So the dynamic there was like, um, everything was based around English. The framing from the well-meaning friends of mine, um, and I've done this to some extent before, like well-meaning, staying on schedule and all this, you kind of isolated a certain language, but the dominant language is English, even though everyone here speaks a different language mostly. So some are bilingual. So let's start anyways. So what did you just do, right? Um, 
So in our own institutions and processes, right, you know, one of the takeaways is like, hey, let's frame it differently so we can all participate fully. We're all going to wear headsets and you can choose to wear it or not, but we're all going to go through that process because it's about all of us communicating instead of saying, for those of you that don't speak English or go to this room or this line or whatever, right? Hmm. Right. So it has implications in all our work, right? Uh, next slide, please. Um, the the folks at uh, Tecolot, you know, they, they came up with the slides. It looks prettier how they did it. Um, I tried to make it, but you, you get the idea, right? So it's always a continuum, right? Um, when Diana was talking earlier about what's the definition, depends on who you ask, right? So these are some concepts and some principles that we're offering. Right. And, and I'm sure you all do a lot of this already. Right. So we can have the exclusion of language. Sorry, this is America. Speak English. You get it a lot. Or you don't speak the proper English. I don't understand what you're saying. Um, and then we're like, well, we'll tolerate. It's cool. We might have a sticker on our car or a poster. And, and those are cool, by the way. They, they look nice and all that. But then we move to access. Right. Um, we saw this with the vaccine rollouts in Houston. Right. Um, doing it in multiple language, et cetera, et cetera. But then at the end, justice, what does that mean, right? So we can do better than access. I think we can do better than equity. What about justice, right? When we talk about liberation. For us at Living Hope Wheelchair Association is we would be in these planning meetings, but it was only Tomas because I was the only uh, bilingual English speaker there. And after a while, I'm like raising my hand, you know, I was a troublemaker. I was just like, wait a minute, we're talking about all these we haven't talked about disability rights and the intersection of disability rights and language justice because most of our communities speak different languages, right? But they're not here planning this, right? A justice framework would be like, wait a minute, let's make sure that we have those most affected in the planning sessions to design the drive-through vaccine rollouts, all of these things. Why is someone like Tomas is the one here? I don't live this life. like like my colleagues did, right? So I hope that illustrates the difference between access is good, tolerance is good, but like justice, it's a little bit different, right? Next slide, please. Okay. Can um, we take it over, Tomas? It's, it's you, I think, yeah, or? Yeah, that sounds okay. good. But we had a really good comment in the chat saying uh, that they had a um, meeting with a ASL interpreter and they had a, some difficulty getting the interpreter on video and the facilitator was like well let's talk about something while we're waiting and it's like no you can't like literally like you know people will not be able to understand and get the information if you do so yeah thank you for that comment um so I know all of this is kind of just like really theoretical and like really this presentation is about kind of this like starting point concept of language justice and then how do you how do we like move towards that and so I'll share a little bit now um, I think the first step really is building organizational commitment. And um, this is, again, a continuous ongoing process for language justice. And that's going to be the same case for building that commitment, but it won't work without it. And I'll be totally frank, you know, Praxis is still working on this and implementing more and more processes in our own organization to address language justice in our own work. Like we're definitely not there either. Um, but it really starts with like a political commitment to like this justice framework um, and recognizing that like having language justice in multiple languages really like can enrich, enliven, and deepen our conversations like in who's at the table and make space for participatory decision making like in a real way. And that it's important to commit as an organization um, because of a lot of things, but and first and foremost is that like it reduces the stress of your staff who are committed to this by like saying that this is something we want to do. It's going to be incorporated in our planning processes. We're going to think about it. We're going to resource it. Um, when we started talking about this at Praxis, like, well, I mean, there's been different iterations of staff, but like the most current iteration, we decided that for all of our events, we were going to have interpretation just like period. It doesn't matter like who's showing up and who doesn't show up. And there are certainly like cohorts of people who just wouldn't be at our events if they didn't know 
like as a default that we have interpretation. They just know that we do and that they can show up, you know? And so if you don't create that space and that intention and put it out there to your community, then they're not going to show up. And if you really want, if you're like, well, why aren't these people coming to these conversations? Like they're the people being impacted. Um, the, it might be why. And so having like that intention set forth for us, like really helped us be able to resource those type of, um, those of all of our events. Like when, when you set up a meeting, you, you know, you set up a Zoom meeting, you probably send a calendar invite, you send an email, maybe you pull together um, an agenda, maybe you put together a PowerPoint. And then you also schedule in your interpreter. So it's just like another one of those steps for us at this point, at least in this specific aspect of like us moving towards language justice at Praxis. Um, so I just wanted to share that, that um, example and that there is like a continuum for all of this. And there's actually a whole list of different ways that like you can work towards language justice as an organization and a continuum. This is one slice of that continuum, like this planning and evaluation, because I thought it was appropriate for this conversation and we're at an event. Um, this is one of the ways that we are trying to incorporate language justice into our work at Praxis. I think that we're probably like in this like building solid commitment for this one slice. Um, we're definitely not like language justice community yet, you know, like there's still a lot that we need to do in order for us to move to towards that point. But, you know, we're trying to think about like, how do we start shifting our processes, start shifting our planning. We're planning earlier to make sure we have interpretation. We're planning earlier to make sure that like some of our materials for certain events are translated. We need to extend that to all of our events is still not quite there, you know, like we're still not there as an organization either. Um, but this is a really good place to start with that commitment. And then you start kind of moving through these steps. And there's, like I mentioned, a whole list of this inside of the toolkit to help you think about all the different areas that you might be able to start thinking about um, moving towards uh, further, you know, forward in this like language justice continuum um, for your own organization. And uh, yeah, it's just about like, you know, we're all about like, it being in praxis at praxis and so just doing it it's not about showing up perfectly for your community it's about showing up powerfully so um it starts with that organizational commitment and i'll share the uh slide that we use the next slide for our interpretation this is just an example our interpreters are really awesome they come we set them up they kind of introduce how it works to people and they can people can join us in different ways on zoom and i certainly have folks who come to my events um, only because they know that there's interpretation available. And we'll move to the next slide. Um, I'm actually going to skip this one and uh, in the for time, uh, you all can read kind of uh, how we do this and all the different steps. I think, you know, first one building that like intention among your staff, but I wanted to share that uh, we have this like language justice toolkit that this presentation is based off of that Tomas worked on along with other amazing language justice advocates. And we always like co-create our content with folks who are doing this work on the ground. We never like claim to know all the answers. We certainly are in our own language justice process at Praxis, like I mentioned, but it focuses on how do you actually do some of this work in a really concrete way? Like how do you get good interpreters? How do you like what equipment do you need to have set up for an event if you're doing an in-person event? Of course, on for online events, it's a lot easier and we don't have that content updated, but um, it's it's the really, there's like really concrete stuff in here, but also like broader kind of strategic and planning tools, including like a needs assessment. How do you um, do strategic communications when you start implementing like language justice? Um, inside your organization so that, you know, you're communicating with the community so that they know and other resources. And you can find it um, with this link here. And I wanted to invite Tomas to say anything else about the toolkit because I know you worked on it directly. Um, yeah, sure. Um, and, and I hope maybe I can answer a few of these questions coming up in the chat. So toolkit, uh, there's considerations in there, for example, cost, right? Uh, considerations of role. What if I don't speak another language? What's my role? I only do bookkeeping and accounting. What's my role, right? There's a role for everyone, right? So this toolkit 
tries to tease out a lot of these, uh, as well as what Diana was just saying about, you know, checklists and how to's, et cetera, right? But main things is this all happened with, um, it was Robert Wood Johnson that funded it, uh, Communities Creating Healthy Environments, but it was a Praxis project in a group of uh, really cool, amazing people that help in to create this, right? So you don't have to do it alone. There's kits like this toolkit, but there's a, a million other ones out there. Just Google it. What's going to work is going to work for you. You're going to be able to create that. But there's roles for everyone. The, the, this kit goes through that. There's roles for everyone. There's a certain series of planning and checklists that you probably already do, right? Um, so use it, right? Uh, take from it. Um, you know, a lot of it is basic project planning, program planning, but with the lens of language, right? But there's a role for everyone. If you don't book the time, it's in here. If you don't book the time for it and make it part of your ongoing work all the time, it's not going to happen. If you don't have the buy-in from your leadership, especially the, the folks that control the raising money, that your development people, your director, it's going to be really hard, right? Do you write line items in, in your grant for translation and interpretation for your events? If not, hmm. So a lot of these tips are inside of this, but there's many other ones on, um, yeah, so there you go. We had a really good question um, from Jamie in the chat about language access falling upon bilingual individuals to provide interpretation or translation services. And this is actually something we've talked about at Praxis because we do have bilingual folks and they do sometimes like do this work. And we've talked about how like, it's really important to kind of like recognize like that skill and if they're not being paid for that to pay them extra or professionalize it in some way by like um bringing in someone who is going to do that work for us and not like have it fall on them and so I think for us another com important conversation was to like kind of have a list of translators and interpreters that we could go to instead of like leaning on staff so that was really important for us to like think about that and process that so that it's not just falling on the folks who are bilingual at Praxis. Um, and so we just, now, now it's part of our budget. We just put it in our budget, you know, like you have to, you have to resource this work. And that includes like thinking like the time that you're spending to think about it, to plan for it. And also like, just like the financial aspect of it. Quick reminder that we want to move into a breakout soon. Yes, uh, I think we are actually ready to move into breakouts. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I don't see the participant numbers going up, so I'm going to assume folks are back from your activity. Um, I hope that was helpful. Um, I know that you all were split into groups where you had a scenario either wayfinding an emergency walk-in or a conference planning. I would love to hear a report back on what you all talked about um, for groups that did wayfinding first. If there's folks who want to share what stood out to you, um, if there's recommendations that you would um, present for these scenarios, and if you thought about um, how to involve your community in planning for some of those solutions. Go ahead, uh, Susan. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So we were the wayfinding group, and we had a lot of good conversation about having staff or volunteers as wayfinders in the hospital or the office building, having signs that are bigger and more regular and have multiple language and graphics and colors, even communicating with patients beforehand so they know what to look for when they're getting to the building. And then, of course, increasing staff training around language justice as well. Awesome, thank you. Other folks in that group, like what did you think? Um, what was it like thinking about this from a language justice perspective versus just language access, if that was something that came up for you all? And you can feel free to type in the chat as well if you'd like. And we have several other people that have their hands up too, Diana. Okay, uh, yeah, sure. Go ahead, um, I have Anna on top. Hi, yeah, we were in group two. We also had Wayfinder and you know, very similarly, we um, addressed having someone, excuse me, um, having someone reach out 
prior to the appointment um, who spoke those languages, uh, maybe engaging in interpretive services. We also kind of thought that maybe this was a smaller office that maybe didn't have those resources, maybe just a phone um, interpretive line, um, which is okay once you're in the appointment, right? But then getting to that appointment becomes a hindrance. And um, just also questioning how do we meet the needs of those people who um, do speak different languages? Because sure, we could have a sign and maybe English and Spanish or maybe two or three others, but there's so many languages, right? So how do you have signage that meets the needs of um, at least maybe your top five or top 10 with signage and making sure that it's obvious your entrances um, to different practices? Thank you, Anna, or Anna. Go ahead, Ashley. It's so great job and shout out to group nine. They um, were really engaged in this process, kind of echoing some of the things that were already brought up, um, included lack of, um, lack of prep from the office. So how can we ensure those needs when we're making the appointment or confirming the appointment? Um, understanding that if we send something in the mail or if we send an email, you know, verifying their address, verifying um, that their email address or that they have email, that they can check it. And then we often get um, this, this overwhelming sense of, oh, well, I sent it to you. So clearly you understand the directions because uh, I sent it in your language. But even when we send things in English, understanding not only what the language needs are of somebody, <clears throat> but also what the literacy levels are for somebody, because if I can't read or if the document is too, um, too complex in terms of readability, then you can send me things all day long and that's not going to work for me. Um, one of our participants, um, Kathy, was really brave sharing her own personal experience. And if we as English speaking white individuals, I've experienced it myself, where we we struggle to find the entrance to a doctor's office or to navigate the system, then what's the issue uh, for us versus, you know, how much more complex and layered is that? Um, we had talked about utilizing a communication model um, to be able to really dissect and understand the staff training needs, um, especially for the, the person at reception. Um, you know, maybe having somebody at triage with um, a Marty or some type of tool that could facilitate, you know, welcome to um, this doctor's office X, wh which office are you trying to find today and how can I assist you in finding that? Um, and then lastly, um, I just lost my train of thought for, uh, oh, understanding dialectical differences for, um, for clients and um, understanding um, that we wanted one more sentence for wayfinding because we know that this client probably at the end um, was kicked out of their appointment. So instead of chastising the client for being late, find out what happened and then help them um, or have them help help the office come up with the solution, make them part of the solution because having them understand what went wrong that helps us plan for future for other clients. Um, and it, it just makes it that much more justice driven because we're not chastising them, we're empowering them to be a part of the solution. So again, great job from group number nine. Thank you, Ashley. Absolutely, thank you for those points. Um, we have two other scenarios. And so I wanna invite everyone else who had wayfinding to type their thoughts and reflections into the chat. And I'd love to invite some folks who were in the emergency walk-in scenario to share what you thought and um, some of the solutions that you came up with. And I'm not sure, uh, I think Prezia is next on my list here. Yeah, so I did have the emergency walk-in scenario. Um, so our group talked a lot about um, how in that scenario, Pascal, who is the main uh, person, is trying to get her daughter help at the emergency room, uh, but she doesn't speak English as proficiently as her daughter. Um, so there's a lot of communication barriers right there. Um, 
when she does get to the emergency room, there's really not a lot of signage that can really help her in her native language. She's getting lost on her own. When she does get to the reception desk, um, she's trying to frantically explain what's going on with her daughter. And what happens is that the receptionist brings people in that are just uh, speaking louder and more slowly because they think that will help. Um, uh, for that scenario, the, what really stood out to our group uh, first and foremost was the child being the interpreter for a lot of us in um, situations in which we're working with the community, working with people who don't speak English as a first language. This happens a lot. Um, and it a lot of things can get lost in transit uh, translation. It's a big issue um, because between a child and a parent, there are things you don't talk about. Uh, regardless of whatever culture you're in, there are things you do not talk about. So how does that kid relay those things? Um, I even gave an example of the other two, three months ago, I was in the emergency room and a Somali woman came in and in the emergency room, they didn't have an, they didn't request her interpreter, didn't have one at the time, but their solution was to take a woman who was Somali from the waiting room and have her interpret instead. And that to me, all I could think about was like, ow, HIPAA, ow, HIPAA. Like that's not, <laughs> that's not okay. Um, that's a complete stranger knowing about your business and the comfortability level for the person looking to understand the patient might rise, but the uncomfortability level of that patient has skyrocketed in those situations. Um, so the group recommended having uh you know, the basics, having those uh, languages first and foremost represented, um, but also having signs that, that could have those visual pieces instead of having words because not everybody reads in their native language as well. Um, things that are easy um, access at hand for language recognition apps, just like how Ashley said the Marty, um, but also having uh, opportunities to coach staff on being more culturally sensitive, more cultural humility, um, how to use the language services and be mindful of how they're speaking uh, and their implicit biases. Thanks, Chrisia. And yeah, you bring up a really good point. Um, putting on my previous public health hat now, I know that there it's not good when you have children interpret. I was definitely a child that interpreted for my parents when I was growing up, but there's a lot. They've done studies about how much gets lost in that interpretation and how inaccurate it gets. And so then when you're relaying important medical information, especially, I know this wasn't, they hadn't even gotten there to that point. Um, but it's really important to have like appropriate like interpretation and translation whenever it's possible. Um, we have maybe time for one more reflection from the emergency walk-in group. Um, Sarah? Yeah, so um, I won't belabor all of the points that Chrissy made because she summarized it pretty well, um, but I would just definitely embolden the fact that um, something that my group spent a lot of time talking about was the fact that the staff saw the solution to limited English proficiency as speaking louder um, when that style is, is really not helpful. It's not a helpful way to communicate. Um, and it was actually shared um, within our group that, you know, her experience is it happens a lot in these healthcare settings where you walk in and the staff recognizes just in looking at you that you are different and you come from potentially a different culture culture or ethnic background. Um, and so on top of needing those interpretive services, um, also, just making sure the manner in which you're communicating with someone um, doesn't change just because of how you're perceiving them and how they look when they walk in. So a solution being to have that sort of, you know, implicit bias training on top of cultural competency, competency training, integrating those language technologies, um, but just making sure those that that very upstream right um, solution to the problem is just to make sure that that styles of communication doesn't change um, and the way you're treating someone doesn't change. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, like there's all these kind of verbal, non, sorry, nonverbal cues that you can get from people. But I think that like what it's important to know is that like when someone doesn't understand something, I think our natural reaction is to kind of nod. And then that can be um, misconstrued for like understanding and that it's really important to be like effectively communicating with the people that you're talking to, having them reflect back or like repeat back to you what you're saying to really like make sure that they're understanding what you're saying too. And so that just made me think about that as well. So we have a few more minutes and I would love to invite the last group conference planning to share back any reflections that they have. I was with group 19 and we had that scenario. So in our scenario, 
um, there was a conference and the one of the people who was really interested in attending the conference did not get the materials inviting her to be a part of it in her primary language and later reflected to someone that she would have loved to have been a part of it and missed it. Um, and we reflected that obviously the dominant issue is that um, the dominant language in the community was used for all communications as opposed to assessing in advance if there are other languages that are widely spoken within the community. Um, we talked about sort of the hidden issue of not really knowing who was in the planning committee for that conference um, and guessed that it probably wasn't very diverse or didn't include um, people who spoke different languages. And then we talked about some solutions being providing um, a translation after the fact, right? So once you're made aware of the issue, provide a translation for as many materials as you can, issue an apology and plan to do better in the future, but um, to avoid these issues, to go ahead and do an assessment of your com com community, figure out um, what are other languages that are widely spoken, um, make space for regular feedback, um, stay on top of community demographics, um, assess if there are groups that you can partner with in the future, so involve the community through creating diverse implementation work groups for future conferences, um, employing persons with lived experience in that culture, and then compensating them for additional translation or interpretation services if they um, support with that, creating guidelines like checklists for future conferences. You have to make sure that you check all these boxes, one of them being that you're communicating um, in the dominant languages within your community and that you are um, doing your due diligence to seek out interpretive resources. And then also someone in our group suggested, and I love this, um, hosting sessions, meetings, or sending out emails in other languages as well and providing English as um, the secondary translation. Thanks so much, Julie. I really appreciate that. Um, I know we're at time, but I wanted to mention that one thing that came up for me thinking about this like scenario specifically is that like if you have everything in text, Google will automatically translate emails and stuff that like that for you. So it's really important, like if you have images that you type out like in the alt text, like what it is that can get translated with like readers and um, just as much as possible, like thinking about like accessibility broadly, because a lot of like online tools can do some of that work for you at this point, which is like really helpful. I know that's like the primary way my parents like will read emails from their banks and stuff like that. It's like just an automatic translator that's on their computers. Um, thank you so much, all of you for um, reporting back. I hope this was helpful. We have a couple of slides here um, remaining. The next one is just a list of resources. Um, a, around multilingual strategies and like the learning, sorry, um, the justice framework stuff that Tomas um, included and the language toolkit. I like pulled out a few things that might be helpful. And then um, the last slide is just our um, info. We're gonna skip this one. Feel free to reflect on <laughs> what you learned today and think about what you wanna take away from it. But this is our information. Feel free to contact us. I think what we'd like to do is like compile some of your questions that you have and Tomas and I can go through and try to answer some of them as like, and put them into like a FAQ at some point and send it back out to you. Um, and I'll pass it back to the conference organizers. Thank you so much. Thank you for um, all of your all's time today and appreciate it. Thank you so much, Diana and Tomas. We really appreciate you. Um, and so they put their contact information. It's here on the slide and also in the chat. So if you have any remaining questions, um, you can feel free to continue to put them in the chat. We will compile them and send them over to the presenters, or you can reach out to them directly. Um, so now we are actually towards the end of our event for today. So we will be moving into another series of poll questions. So these may look familiar to you if you were on at the beginning of today's event. Um, so they should be on your screen now and we'll leave them up for one minute. Looks like we've got some pretty good participation here. Appreciate that. Um, and after this, we'll actually give you the link to the evaluation as well. So this information is for you, um, but we always want to know how we can 
do better. You know, we're, we're always thinking about our data. Um, so we would ask that each of you complete this evaluation. It'll pop up on your next screen and you can use your smartphone to um, scan the QR code that's there, but the link is also available on the slide and it looks like it was also put into the chat. Um, we may need to, there, there it is. Okay, so it's also in the chat for you there. And then we also just closed the poll. So just wanted to give you a little bit of information here. So in terms of knowing that you have a role to play to improve the conditions in your community, it's 97% of you said yes. Um, that compares to about 92% of you at the beginning of this. Um, knowing of at least one tool or resource that can help advance health equity in your community, 99% of you said yes, compared to just, let me say about, 71% of you at the beginning of this, which is fantastic. And then finally, feeling confident in your ability to take action against racial injustice, 91% of you said yes, compared to just 61% at the beginning of this. So thank you so much. And now I'm going to pass this over to Dr. Daryl Hood to close us out. Thank you very much. And, you know, this has been an absolute wonderful experience, uh, at least it, from my perspective. I think that, that we all have learned something. Um, and and I just like to sort of start out here um, with this uh, graphic, because it takes me back to 2019. And um, this is uh, from the College of Public Health. Um, when we were attempting to decide at the very beginning when we started this exercise, where we were on the diversity inclusive excellence continuum. And, and I think that this morning, the Dean indicated that, um, well, this is where we started, of course. Um, and I would like to think that perhaps after three years, we aren't really simply just valuing diversity anymore we are actually uh, moving towards inclusive excellence. Maybe we're sort of in the managing diversity um, tier here. Clearly, we know that uh, affirmative action is going to disappear with the way that politics is uh, in this country right now. And my dean um, alluded to this uh, earlier uh, this morning. Um, I hope you caught that, um, but nevertheless, I think that we're now, after three years um, with Columbus Public Health, um, for sure, and um, we can sort of take uh, a, a forward-looking view of what we might imagine going forward. And so we've learned how to talk the talk, but now we actually have a set of robust tools that have actually shown us how to walk the walk, and um, let's use these tools. And so it's really intuitive in terms of the call to action for each one of us as we go back to our individual institutions and organizations as we figure this out. And so we began with Amy, you know, and um, Amy was very, very forthcoming in terms of her reflections um, as it relates to where she is on that diversity and inclusive excellence continuum. And she shared some very robust tools um, with us. So how will each one of us go back to our organizations and use those tools um, as it were? Um, as well, we then moved to Dr. Valenzuela and, um, you know, I just fell in love with his um, presentation because uh, it was very, very close and dear to my heart. And I think we've known for quite some time what the um, upstream drivers of some of the disparate health outcomes that, that um, have befallen um, vulnerable individuals in our society. And, and so let's take a look at his tool and let's take it back to our individual organizations and, and use it for the common good. Um, that bad sugar um, uh, video 
really, really was eye opening with regard to some of the chronic health outcomes, the disparate health outcomes that we're seeing in the communities that I work in here in Columbus. Um, as well, um, the pandemic and racism community advisory group uh, framework. I was very, very excited about that. And, and of course, as we close the day out with Diana and Tomas just now, I'm, I'm really appreciative for um, learning what language just injustice, language justice, um, what that actually entails and the right to be free from discrimination based on language, the right to maintain non-dominant languages and pass it on to future generations. These, um, these concepts really resonated um, with me. I'm from, the, uh, from North Carolina in the Cherokee region. The right for everyone's languages to be valued and respected. And so um, in terms of building that organizational commitment and, and uh, within the context of the continuum that they just um, shared with us, I think it's incumbent upon all of us to go back to our institutions and implement. And we heard last night in particular, um, the interfacing with uh, uh, communities is gonna be seminal and central to our purpose, collective purposes. And just think of it this way, in your organization, um, you can use these tools to, and you're gonna have to use these tools to maintain um, continuity as we move forward um, within an organization, as well with the uh, community. Um, there's congruence in that aspect of moving um, equity forward because we have to listen to the community. And you heard the assistant commissioner last evening, first and foremost, um, on his mind. And, uh, and I think we're in a good place now. And, and um, Jaleesa, I, I think that that's, um, if you don't have, if you're ready, we can begin thanking individuals. Is that okay? <laughs> Well, thank you all for joining us. We really do appreciate your time and your attention. Um, we really do hope that you did uh, get some good information out of this that you are going to um, not just learn, but do um, things with. Again, thank you to the Planning Committee from Columbus Public Health, as well as the OSU College of Public Health, um, to all of the facilitators and everyone else who uh, may not have been specifically mentioned, but we truly do appreciate um, everything that you've done. Have a great day, and we hope to see you next year.